The market's probably a little bit overdone or was overdone into the end of the year. People dashed into this market. They extended the expectations of rate cuts. Whether the Fed cuts with March or May probably is not that much of a big deal. Is that the Fed that is going to cut this year? I think that's what's important. The idea that the market's got five rate cuts priced in, six last week, five now, that might be wildly optimistic. I think there are a number of things that could come in and trip this market up a bit, but usually it's something the market doesn't see coming. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Sell-off, what sell-off? Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market slightly softer this morning on the S&P, down by a third of 1% yesterday. The biggest one-day rally, TK, going back to the middle of November, the rebound of the last 24 hours. So I so want chart that it says uh, the Magnificent Seven made back 75% of the agony of the last number of, of days. I don't know what it was, but it was sobering for the people out there setting up for a clue. And to start with Ben Laidler this morning on the Magnificent Seven, on this Bitcoin ETF stuff, speaks to the enthusiasm that's out there. You sound enthusiastic about the latter. Don't get me going. Yeah, I can't wait for ben your views to on that. Me. The earnings of the last 24 hours as well, Lisa, we need to talk about that too. Raising the outlook over at Lululemon, Abercrombie as well, yeah, just a better picture the going forward. Yesterday. Festive activewear. Did you see that? That they had festive. Is that what it's called? Sort of theory-based, um, you know, holiday activewear. And I was looking for pictures of it because I didn't see any festive Thank activewear God for that. at Lululemon. But nonetheless, they did increase their outlook. So that's what we're going to look at. What does that there. look like? What does festive activewear look sure. like? That's my like you didn't open my Christmas card. Leggings, you know. Oh right, those things. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I've never seen that. It's, a, it's, at it's it on my Christmas card. It's a shot. I didn't of me. know Lulu did that. I didn't yeah. know either. But they said that they had good promotions and they had a good kind of outlook going forward. Of course, I looked at Lululemon earnings of okay course. good yes i'm glad that we were they good were they are they getting yes, it done yes but that's the whole thing it's this question around okay well people are still buying things that are too expensive than they should be and they're still putting out the discretionary spending <clears throat> in areas like leisure everything's so personal for you i love that <laughs> even shopping let's talk about jeffries the numbers from jeffries really not great at all Bramo, your thoughts on that just going into earnings from jp morgan and bank of america this coming friday so there are a couple of issues jeffries of course really uh, takes more of its revenue from the merchant banking the m and the, the bond and stock offerings, and we know that that's been really slow in 2023. So how much is this a measure of what we're going to see in J.P. Morgan versus the broad reach of some of the major banks? That said, talking yeah. about a trough, talking about a more than 50 percent decline in some of their revenues, really a bleak year at a time when we're hoping for well, a turnaround. We've seen that in the stock performance. We'll swing over to private equity and private credit as well. And what you do in January is you look to February to get through bonus and keep your best people is where is the right sizing going to come from? Right sizing is one of the gentle words for this, but based on what I've seen so far, right sizing seems to be in order. More on that a little bit later. Let's check out shares of Boeing. Boeing yesterday down 8%, biggest one-day loss going back to 2022, biggest one-day loss in more than a year. This morning, just about unchanged, but some unsettling news in the last few hours, I would say, Tom, from the likes of Alaska Air, United Airlines, saying late Monday <coughs> that initial maintenance checks uncovered loose bolts, with the latter, United Airlines saying there have been signs of installation issues in some of its aircraft. Yeah. Slightly worrying, just a bit. Off of Spirit Aerosystems, I believe, of Kansas, George Ferguson was of immense value on this yesterday, and what he was speculating about 24 hours ago became true about 12 hours ago. You don't want to hear that the screws are loose on the plane that you're about to get into. That's essentially what they were saying, is that the screws were loose in certain places, which is a big problem. And the reason why you're not seeing that rebound today, at least... Does, it doesn't limit flights, so, though. I mean, it's got to. I mean, if you're grounding X number of planes, I mean, you don't replace them. You don't dial 1-800-Airbus and say, you know, you don't... You know, you know, Get over there and get. We're still trying to work out, Tom, how broad this investigation is going to be. And some unsettling stories reporting around that particular flight on Friday. The maintenance checks that were meant to take place, did they take place? <clears throat> Did they, they, they take warnings. place? No, they had The lights. warnings came up, yes, right precisely, but, that, but how did they again, deal with those warnings, Lisa? And can they just tighten the screws? Or do they have to do right, something seriously. else to really understand exactly you know, where the Lisa, protocol is? Lisa, did you notice that John and I today on radio, it's tough to see, but, you know, we're very matchy-matchy today. I did notice that. You know, you know I mean, it's like, I got you know, an earful when I mentioned it, it too. It's, it's good. Yeah. I didn't give you an earful. No. TK did. Come on. 
<laughs> Let's get to the scores on the S&P 500. <laughs> Equity futures Where's negative 0.3% <laughs> on the S&P. Just pulling back a little bit. Up a touch in yields on a 10-year, up a single basis point, 4.0436%. And the euro, it's snoozy out there. We're negative 0.1% at 10935 <laughs> It's a great note from Kit Jukes this morning, if yes. you've read it over at SockGen, just about the data that's coming out of Germany. The data that's coming out of Germany just is not good at all. That over-reliance on Russian energy and Germans' industries, Achilles Hill, is now well understood. And maybe the German statistics office should stop publishing economic data anyway, <laughs> because ultimately, <laughs> every time it comes out, Lisa, it doesn't look good. Calling them the new old man of Europe, which I knew exactly who he was talking about with that headline. What we're watching today, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in Tel Aviv. This comes after he visited Turkey, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, and Jordan. It's interesting that we're hearing that uh, Saudi Arabia still is interested, at least according to Tony Blinken, in normalizing relations with Israel. It just feels like something is shifting and we're on the precipice of a new phase one way or another. 12 p.m., we hear from Fed Vice Chair for Supervision, Michael Barr, talking about banking regulation. Is there going to be some sort of furthering in the aftermath of March and the whole meltdown there, especially with any changes to the program that's basically been bailing out a number of banks for uh, the short-term funding? And 1 p.m., the Treasury is selling $52 billion yes. to three-year notes. I actually am very curious to see how, what the uptake is, because we just saw yesterday the New York Fed come out. The expectations for three-year inflation actually fell to the lowest since 2020. So do you see that come in with a bid into this, or is there something that is a disconnect between the sentiment and the market action? This is why you wake up in the morning, TK, for that a little bit later. It's exciting. It's exciting. Ben Layler joins us now. Stop trolling me. Global market strategist <laughs> at eToro. Ben, great to catch up with you, sir. Let's get straight to it. Your line, momentum is a powerful strategy. Ben, just build on that. What do you mean by that? Listen, I, there was a lot of focus on the weak start to January. January is typically, you know, a strong month. So it's generated, you know, it's generated some nervousness. Um, but I think it's, frankly, to be expected. We've pulled forward huge returns into the fourth quarter. Uh, I'm still very bullish for 2024, but I do think it's going to be very different to the rally we saw last year. I think it'll be a bit smaller. I think it'll be back-ended. I think it'll be more cyclical. And I think it'll be more global. Uh, so I think um, we're looking for the rally. I think it's well supported on these sort of twin pillars of rate cuts and accelerating earnings. But I think it'll be very different to right. 2023. Ben, I've got to rip up the script today with you because eToro is really wedded to the idea of crypto as an investment asset. Crypto stocks and beyond is the banner headline from your shop. As we see crypto ETFs come in here, are they going to be part of your market analysis? Is Bitcoin an investable asset? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, obviously, everything in moderation, you know, do your research, be diversified. But, you know, this was by far the best performing asset class, you know, last year, admittedly off a miserable 2022. And I think the, the interesting thing about the uh, potential ETF now is it just broadens access to uh, that asset class. And it's the first, I think, of many catalysts that are out there. We have an Ethereum ETF coming with the Bitcoin halving coming with the Fed cutting interest rates. Right. We've changed the counting regs in the U.S., which will make it easier for companies to buy crypto. We bank regs, which will make it easier for banks to own crypto. You know, I can go on and on. The point is that, A, I think, you know, this is by far your smallest, youngest, most retail dominated asset class. And I think it's very sensitive to you know, any of these sort of growing institutionalization, um, you know, developments over the next year or so. With the constraint on the supply of Bitcoin, can it become a member of the Magnificent Seven? I mean, do you see that kind of later three year, five year appreciation? We saw 150% last year, right? Which is three times what you saw at a tech. Uh, I, you know, it's a it's a 1.6 trillion asset class. I mean, it's smaller than, you know, or similar size to any one of those names with a laundry list of catalysts ahead. And I think a big, um, you know, institutionalization story. I, you know, from purely supply and demand uh, perspective, I'm I, I'm reasonably constructive. Apart from Bitcoin, we're looking at a scenario where a lot of people still see big tech leading or at least not falling behind and that that's going to be a big part of the back end rally that you see for 2024. How much are you adjusting and leaning in right now in any turbulence or in other words, any dips whatsoever? Are you buying them? Or are you kind of waiting to really get in at a better time? I think the big story for this year 
actually even bigger than the overall you know, market direction story is the rotation story. Out of last year's sort of winners, the sort of big tech, defensive growth, teddy bear stocks, you know, into the depressed, the cheaper, the out of favor assets that are most sensitive to the base case for an economic soft landing and interest rate cuts. So that's healthcare, that's financials, that's small cap, that's Europe, that's emerging markets. It's not big tech. Big tech is absolutely fine. They're growing earnings, um, but you know they're already growing earnings. We're not looking for the big earnings recovery. Valuation's already very high. That sensitivity is, is coming elsewhere. So by all means, you know, hold on to some of your tech stocks. But I think the action for this year is coming from elsewhere, and that's what people should be looking at. I've never heard of tech stocks referred to as teddy bear stocks. I am curious, going forward, when you talk about financials, we just got Jeffrey's earnings, and they were not great. They expressed a lot of hope that things are going to get better. There's a feeling that M&A can only go up, IPOs can only go up. Some of the other issuances, similarly, how much is that part of your bullish thesis on financials, and how important are J.P. Morgan's earnings on Friday? Yeah, so... I think for this rally to keep going, and the reason I say it's back ended is because the two twin pillars of rate cuts, I think, you know, we're all debating how many and when, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, they will be started by the second half of the year. And secondly, this earnings acceleration, this idiosyncratic earnings acceleration, because it, it's going to come even as the economy slows, I think it's more of a second half story. So I fully expect bank results to be absolutely miserable. Um, you know, consensus is down, you know, 20 percent plus. They're going to take loan provisions. They're not seeing any capital markets activity. You know, it's darkest before dawn. Uh, but I think, you know, we're going to start lapping that as we move into next year, as, the, as interest rates start to come down, as the economy begins to firm up in the second half. So it, it's the earnings delta I'm, I'm looking for. I'll just give you one example. You know, Europe, which is financials, is the biggest sector. Earnings were down 10% last quarter. By the end of this year, they should be up 30 to 40%. And you're seeing that sort of earnings delta across all these cyclicals. And I think that's what people should be focused on as we look for the soft landing and we look for interest rate cuts. Ben, do you think that trade has already begun, already started, maybe even close to completion in Europe after the rally we've already seen? It's absolutely started, but it is has a long, long way to go. Look at the, valua the valuation gap, even if you sector adjust it, is absolutely enormous. Earnings are still, as they say, very depressed and set for just a huge swing, which I think is, is, is underappreciated. So I think we have a long way to go. Remember, you know, these assets have underperformed for literally decades <laughs> and, and they're also tiny. A little bit of money coming out of supersized U.S. markets or tech markets goes a very, very long way in some of these smaller asset classes and assets. You just got to give up the teddy bears, which, as you know, Ben. It's difficult. It's difficult. Ben Laidler of Itaro. Ben, thank you. I've never heard that either, Bramo, but no, I like it. Is, Teddy no, Bear stocks. You sort of hold them no, close. Yeah, no, night you know, night rewarding. Well, cuddle at night. Sleep well at night. Yeah, yeah. No, Lizzie right. Saunders, seriously, Lizzie Ann Saunders is very good at the Teddy Bear sector. This is Steve Ross out of MIT. And when he would, did factor analysis, he has momentum, value, some of the other stochastic issues. And then one of the sectors is the Teddy Bear sector. No, real deal. Yeah. No, so I understand. Yeah. Up at, up at MIT. I, read, I read that chapter. Yeah. It's an important yeah, Saunders book. did a dissertation <laughs> at Delaware on that years ago. <laughs> Honestly, Tom could say anything with a straight face and most people would believe him. <laughs> yeah. How's in the next the hour on Bloomberg TV, <laughs> Emily Rowland of John Hancock Investment Management. Catch up with Emily a little well, bit later. We need to talk John about... John Hancock, he wrote a big signature on the declaration. <laughs> I did say that, right? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, this is, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what, what, what's that got to do with anything? Are you doing the like big I've got The big signature of John Hancock. You learned that as a kid. Okay. One of the great sadnesses of Boston is they tore down his house. It was a right. terrible... This is, this is quite a tangent. All right. Are you done? I'm done. <laughs> okay, good. Want a teddy bear. <laughs> no, I think someone else wants a teddy bear. Okay. Johnny Hancock did not wear Lululemon. <laughs> Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy coming up next. We need to talk about policy. Janet Yellen wading into the debate about rate cuts, or rather tax cuts, and whether they should be extended or not. More on that still to come. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. Twenty-four nominating contests are here, and the candidates are making their cases to voters in Iowa ahead of the caucuses. 
Bloomberg is live in the ground, bringing you the fastest news. Trump is leading by a long shot. Insightful interviews. And at the end of the day, that's what the American people want. And the most informative analysis about what it all means for November's presidential election. What is your path to the nomination? It all starts Monday in Iowa, only on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. Our strong preference is that the Houthis get the message that they're receiving from countries around the world that this needs to stop, and that's what we're focused on. It's clearly not in the interest of anyone, Israel, Lebanon, Hezbollah for that matter, uh, to, see this, uh, to see this escalate and to see an actual conflict. And the Israelis have been very clear with us that they want to find a diplomatic way forward. That was U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken addressing these situations in the Red Sea and the rising tensions in the Middle East, continuing his shadow diplomacy trip in the region. We can't talk about that without talking about this, the curious case of the missing defense secretary. The response from Congress has been pretty strong, TK, let's put it that way. Republican Senator Susan Collins saying this, given the extremely serious military decisions that the United States is dealing with, including attacks on our troops by Iranian-backed proxies, the war in the Middle East, and the ongoing aggression by Russia in Ukraine, it is inexplicable that the Secretary's condition remains shrouded in secrecy. Democrat Seth Moulton <coughs> saying this, Tom, the fact that this occurred with the secrecy of defense and his own deputy, let alone the president didn't know, is astounding. Still yeah. trying to work out the details of this one. You know this, John, early, early yesterday morning when all this broke is it's going to get worse. And I think the worser continues. I, I, I just don't understand how this goes away for the president of the United States. I want to read the play by play as you were talking about, uh, just in terms of, especially as we were hearing about some of the attacks that were taking place in uh, Iran and at that uh, at that celebration or at the memorial uh, of, on those attacks. I mean, at this point, why was the defense secretary not in conversations with the White House? Precisely. And if they weren't, who was? How is the communication getting transmitted? And if this isn't the case, if they don't give this information, how does Joe Biden continue to stand behind him and say he's had full faith in this individual? But that was what got my attention yesterday, Tom. If you go back to the play-by-play -play of last week, what we do know, there was the terrorist attack in Iran on the Wednesday. And I find it difficult to believe that no one in the White House reached out to the Pentagon when that was going on trying to get details. And it was only until Thursday, reportedly, that the uh, president realized they didn't know where the defense secretary was. And there's a historic overlay on this, John. I, I took it back yesterday to Woodrow Wilson, but, but there's just no question about it. It is part of our fabric. What do you do in terms of the chain of, the com of command, I should say, of the nation? Terry Haynes briefs now, founder of Pangea Policy. Terry, you and I learned in Civics 101, this started with Mrs. Wilson. Woodrow Wilson had a series of strokes really going back to the 1890s. And then there was a penultimate stroke, I'm going to say 1919. He lost sight of his left eye and onward. We have a history of this. And critically, we have a legal process for the president, the 25th Amendment and all that does this. What should the Secretary of Defense do? What's his duty this morning? Uh, I think fundamentally his duty is to resign, and I think uh, fundamentally the duty is among those of White House staff that are uh, that are involved in this sort of chain of command and uh, tracking people uh, to stand down as well. Uh, you all covered it very well, and the word astounding is uh, is is absolutely the case. For markets, what uh, you know, my view is that. You know, regardless of what you think about uh, Biden's age, potential infirmity, anything else, regardless of that, uh, people are comforted by the idea that, you know, well, there's a competent professional staff underneath him, a cabinet around him. Uh, if if neither of those are true, um, you know, that is a uh, the, that's a geopolitical risk spike and a problem all by itself. It might correct that there's a comfort now to resignations at the administration or frankly, in other parts of government, because we're so near the election. Now's a good time to exit, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I think so, probably. Uh, and certainly Secretary Austin could, uh, you know, could do other things uh, similar to what uh, retired military officers generally do, serve on boards and then lecture and the like. 
Uh, but somebody's going to have to take responsibility for this. And, you know, there's been an awful lot of smoke coming out of the White House and, and reported that, you know, Biden's famously loyal. Biden's going to stand by his guy, all the rest. They're going to figure out uh, they should have figured out already and haven't uh, that that's not going to stand and they need to uh, place a different uh, a different look on this. If you wonder why, for example, uh you know, the Israelis aren't paying very much attention to White House preferences on how the Gaza war is conducted. Look no further than, uh, you know, look no further than the White House and Secretary of Defense situation, frankly. It's, Henry, it's such a powerful point. Typically, this is a question that I think conspiracy theorists like to probe, but I think it's pertinent, important in the last 24 hours. Who's actually running the government? Uh, we don't know, do we? And uh, the that's uh, that's a little disquieting all by itself. Uh, if you have a situation, I mean, it goes farther for those uh, viewers who haven't seen this. Uh, Secretary of Defense is out of action. The chief of staff is indisposed. The deputy is on vacation. I mean, it's not just Austin. And, uh, and the idea that the White House had no idea, and the White House supposedly has tracking systems in real time, the idea that uh, the White House had no idea where its Secretary of Defense was is, uh, is mind-boggling, and that's not a word I use frequently. Which raises the question, especially because you're talking about Lloyd Austin and how you think he should resign. Who takes his place? Is there another person who has familiarity with what's going on uh, to have the continuity necessary to really engage with some really difficult international uh, issues? Uh, there's a lot of potential candidates uh, out there. You know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of four stars. There's a lot of people on very much active duty. One person, and I don't want to go uh, you know, sort of put him out there on his own. Uh, one person that comes to mind when you ask me that question is somebody that already uh, does a lot of work with Bloomberg, Admiral Stavridis, uh, who is very, you know, fits that template very well. Somebody who's been a flag officer, but also understands very well the, uh, the, the sort of geopolitical challenges that are faced and would bring a command posture to the, uh, to the position that's desperately needed now. Terry, I wanted to squeeze this in. The contours of the policy debate coming together in election season, Secretary Yellen Wang in, I thought this was interesting in the last 24 hours, said extending all the 2017 tax cuts won by former President Donald Trump would lead to, quote, serious concerns over the federal deficit. Are we just setting the foundations of stage, Terry, for that battle to take place over the next few months? Uh, we're, we're setting the foundation for the election and for a 2025 battle. You know, my, my advice to markets has been since Yellen was appointed that you shouldn't look at Yellen as some sort of independent actor anymore. Uh, she's a uh, she's a Biden soldier. And uh, and her her political capital that she had when she was an independent actor in Washington is no longer hers. It belongs to Biden. So, you know, my view of that is uh, she's she's being a, a good line soldier and saying, you know, we can't possibly have tax cuts because it would it would increase the deficit. That's uh, that's Democratic orthodoxy. It's sounding more and more like a politician. Terry, thank you, sir. Terry Haynes there of Pangea Policy. At least weigh in on that. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen saying extending all the 2017 tax cuts would lead to, quote, serious concerns over the federal budget deficit. I would continue that on by saying what else would be a serious concern? Would it be that uh, borrowing costs remain at the levels that they are now, considering that that will lead to a massive surge in interest expense? What is the threshold between totally sustainable yeah. and serious concern. That's what I want to understand from her. In, in the confusion, we should note that as Secretary of Treasury, this is, her, this is her field. She's supposed to comment on things like this. What's interesting is if you have a former central banker as Treasury commenting on monetary policy or Jerome Powell commenting on fiscal policy, in the old days, that was confusing. I guess the old days are gone. Well, hold on a second. I actually think that she was really smart in the way that she adjusted issuance. And she actually staved off some sort of revolt by bond investors last year by the fact that she then issued more T-bills rather than longer-term debt in order to <clears throat> not necessarily flood the market and with coupon issuance. But this year changes. And that's when you start to see maybe the, the yeah. U.S. government have to lock in borrowing costs at a much higher pace and face off with much higher interest expenses, and she will have to yeah, I think it's that. a really important insight in that they had the confidence to go short term. And now what is a huge mystery, huge mystery. I'm sure there's people screaming at the television set right now, asking, well, what happened to issuing long-term debt when rates were, like, near zero? I'm not sure yeah. we should give the Treasury a round of applause for its maturity profile management 
People say that the they, US increased debt. It. they didn't increase it <laughs> as much. I know. It's like we 100 year debt. Where was sure. that? From New York, this is Bloomberg. Biggest one-day mm -hmm. rally on the S&P 500 going back to the middle of November in yesterday's session. This morning, pulling back by 0.4%, just a touch softer on the S&P and the Nasdaq. We're down a half of 1%. On a rust, sort of small caps getting punished, down a little more than 1%. The next stop for this market, CPI, Thursday, earnings on Friday. The numbers out of Jefferies. Not great yesterday, Bramo. Not great at all. You saw actually a 53% drop in the earnings revenue for the period compared with a year earlier. Not great, but they said this was the trough. And it looks bright ahead and you can see the resurgence and potential deals and everything's got to get better. Great. That is the hope that's being baked into a lot of financials. Speaking of hope, I just love the line from Ben Leder of eToro a little bit earlier this morning. Teddy bear stocks. The ultimate teddy bear stock of the last 24 hours. The last 12 months for that matter. NVIDIA? Yep. They just have to say, yeah, new product. I don't think you even have to read what the new product is. Sometimes, Lisa, I think you just say new product and they're like, new product, <laughs> bye. <laughs> You're literally reading my mind. I saw that. I looked at how uh, NVIDIA really led the, uh, the gains yesterday, as they have for the past 12 months, as you pointed out. They rolled out new chips. They talked about more processing <laughs> abilities. Right. And woo! My best conversation in the new year on this is Anurag Rana of Bloomberg Intelligence, truly expert on the cloud and the phrase he uses, John, for all these fancy companies and stuff I don't understand is addressable market, which is the guesstimate of what the future market is out five in 10 years. And the fancy word, John, is ginormous. And that's the equity market story, Tom. A few more asset classes to get through. Let's move to bonds. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year. Yields on treasuries shaping up as follows. Up a single basis point. Still just above 4% on a 10-year. 4.04%. If we turn to foreign exchange, it's a snooze for the euro. It's always a snooze at the moment, isn't it? 109.31. We're negative there by about 0.2%. But the data, look, the data out of Germany, at least I know it's November industrial production for whatever that's worth but the trend is clear it's not great data you know i spent a lot of time thinking about this last night the problem is what's being priced in what is the expectation? We know that German industrial manufacturing is under pressure. We know that there are some issues with energy. We know it's been a tough slog. What's being priced in? And I think that's part of the problem with the reason why the euro dollar has been basically some knowledge. The hope that even if the data is bad, Tom, that ultimately the ECB is about to cut interest rates. That's where the hope is, yeah. I think, for many. Well, the hope on the ECB is simple. Carl Weinberg with a blistering note this morning, John, that has to do with your trip to Davos. A, he says they're at 1.9% inflation right now. They're way, way behind. And Weinberg meant this no words. Davos is an opportunity for Lagarde to pivot. It's a time for her to make a statement on this. On the schedule a few times. Yeah. Next week, you'll hear a lot from the ECB president. Let's get to the top stories under surveillance this morning. Boeing suffering its worst day in a year as the investigation into the Alaska Airlines incident widens. Both Alaska and United Airlines saying initial maintenance checks on other 737 MAX 9 aircraft uncovered loose bolts. <coughs> United saying there had been signs of, quote, installation issues. The National Transportation Safety Board not ruling out a wider investigation into the aircraft. Yesterday, the stock down about 8%, muted price action this morning. But I tell you what, some really unsettling reporting, Lisa, from a few of these companies. Especially because the light had been on and they didn't really know exactly what happened. One of my favorite parts of the story, and I realize it's a tangent, is a 64-year-old physics teacher who found the uh, plug in his backyard. And he was talking about how the 50-foot trees acted as air cushions to really keep it intact, as well as the iPhone that fell out as well. Oh, yes, him. of course. That too. Basically, that's the reason why those things didn't explode. But it's just basically such a blessing, if nothing else, that nobody got seriously hurt question now is, where does Boeing go forward? Whose fault oh. is it? How do they really uh, reignite some confidence? I had a personal bias here. My father did a lot of work with Boeing with Hughes Electronic, which was their satellite company they bought years ago. This was back to 1997. And at the time, the shocking merger, John, of Boeing and McDonnell Douglas. And the answer is, I did a fancy Bloomberg chart on this. And here's the core question. What's happened at Boeing since 2016? I can't answer that. We're not doing a McKinsey thing here, but something changed in the pixie dust on or about 2016. Uh, you're not the only one asking that question, yeah. eh? Right. Let's turn to that single aircraft, that aircraft. Lisa, if you knew that an aircraft you were getting gum shouldn't be flying over water to places like Hawaii, but it was okay to fly domestically, 
over land, <laughs> would you get on the plane? So here's the thing, and this is sort of the leap of faith oh. of flying, is that you have to kind of trust it because right? not everybody understands aeromechanics. And everyone's going to say, well, I'm sure that they signed off and it's just fine. Mm. But you're right. If they're going to basically say, like, well, you can only go up to, you know, 15,000 Then fly feet, to Hawaii on this one. Yeah, this one, this one might not make it. So, <laughs> well, you know, I, I know we got to move on, but for those of you on radio, <laughs> the video here on television of the duct tape and the plastic Seriously. around the hole is like, you know, it's like, like where you, you screw something up at home and you're trying to... <laughs> the <laughs> more you find out, the more concerning Oh, I don't mean, is. I mean, this is not funny. It's I'm not so funny sorry, at folks. all. It's only funny because there wasn't any serious injuries, oh. Tom, but we're like... This it's close to having a real accident, yeah. it seems. Let's turn to this story. Lawmakers demanding answers as the mystery remains around the absence of Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. Austin failing to notify the White House for four days after being hospitalized on January 1st. And the Defense Department has still not disclosed why Austin is still at Walter Reed. The White House standing by Austin, ruling out any possibility of him losing his job. Terry Haynes of Panchiha on the program 10, 15 minutes ago, saying the man should resign. Most look to come on that particular story. Want to finish on this one? Some good news for the people of Michigan. A 26-year drought is over. The <coughs> university winning the college football national championship game, beating the Washington Huskies 34-13. It marks a 12th national title for the Wolverines. Yeah. TK the first since 1997. It was incredible in the third quarter there in the huddle there, and they have the microphone in the huddle like they do because it's a big game, and the quarterback's going, let's do the SOM rule. You know, it's, <laughs> it's not what that happens in that old Claudia Sam was right there in the middle of it with Justin Wolfers. You can and, tell no one around the, this table watched that game, <laughs> can't you? <laughs> the rest of, Justin Wolfers was there. It's not Australian football rules. Well, Wolfers probably was there. Well, you, you know he yeah, was. He was there. Guys, such a study was probably <laughs> Crushing here. this. We're going to move on from college <laughs> football idea. to the uh, excitement of foreign exchange. The Euro has been somnolent. Jane Foley is never quiet, head of foreign exchange strategy at Rabobank. Where is the excitement right now, Jane Foley? Where is the movement in the next 90 days of a foreign exchange pair? You know what, I think you can get excitement, maybe not in uh, euro dollars so much, but look at the yen, I think that's pretty, been pretty exciting uh, today. What about the, the, the Swedish crown? What about that Swiss franc? You know, it was back to uh, the, the strongest levels that it's seen since, since yeah. that amazing day uh, several years ago when, when the SMB uh, 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 stepped away from maintaining that uh, 120 floor. So, you know, th there is some action here, but yeah, it is quite disappointing that well, euro dollar is, is not perhaps uh, brought as the excitement that many of us had an uh, anticipated. You know, Jane, what I'm looking at, I'm, looking, I'm triangulating Swiss, uh, Swiss every day, trade-rated Swiss, Euro-Swiss, uh, dollar-Swissy uh, as well. Let's cut to the chase. What do you suggest the SNB will do if we break through new strong Swiss franc? You know, that's, I think, a really important question and one that's perhaps not been asked enough because I think we, we're in danger, perhaps, of, of looking at Switzerland in the same way that we're looking at uh, uh, most of Europe or, or the US, where we've had, you know, significant inflationary problem in recent years. I think it's really important to remember for Switzerland, like Japan, um, that over the last few decades, they really had issues with deflation, disinflation. And whilst inflation right now is just below 2%, is in, in a sweet spot, I think they're going to be a little bit nervous uh, about going back to seeing too much disinflation over the next year or two. And I think if the Swiss franc uh, does continue on this course of, of strength, that that will become a potentially an issue, uh, you know, during the course of this year. So actually, I, I would say perhaps in, in, in contrast to what I'm saying about most other central banks in the G10, I think there's a risk that the SMB will bring forward interest rate cuts. And at a time when I'm actually suggesting that for most other central banks, I think the market's priced in interest rate cuts too early. Jane, I'd love your help. The value of Fed, ECB, SNB speak right now at a time of incredible economic uncertainty, at a time where a lot of people are just ignoring any of the signals and words that some of these central bankers are saying. We did hear from a number of Fed bankers uh, this week, including Raphael <coughs> Bostic uh, of the Atlanta Federal Reserve, as well as Michelle Bowman, a traditional hawk, who came out and basically talked about how, yes, she'd be interested in cutting rates, but really pushing back, saying that if inflation stays high, they might have to hike again. Do you pay any heedance, any credence to any of the uh, hawkish rhetoric in the pushback we've been getting on the margins from the Fed? Yeah, I do. Now, you know, the, the, the S&B and, and the Bank of Japan aside, so, you know, put those two to one side because they're different. Uh, 
otherwise, I think we really do have to pay attention to this, these inflationary threats. So, for instance, you know, think about the shipping that's now going around the, the, the Cape of Good Hope, around Africa, and rather than the, the Suez Canal. Who's going to pay for that? Who's going to pay the in additional insurance premiums that you know that shippers have to now pay for for, for, for shipping? Who's going to pay for the fact that you know for months now we we've had a, 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 a limited shipping going through the Panama Canal because of the water shortages? Who's going to pay for those additional insurance premiums because we've had extra flooding? Uh, because there's been drought? You know, all of these different climate change issues going forward. So I don't think supply chains or supply chain disruption, yes, as we knew it in 2020, that's gone. But I think supply chain disruption in some form because of climate change or geopolitical risk is still here. That's inflationary. We've also got a, a, an aging population. That means there's labour market shortages. That means that there's probably going to be opportunity for more labour market strife and for more uh, higher pay uh, uh, increases throughout uh, the US and Europe where the, where the population is, 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 is aging. So I think that we are in a different economic environment than we were 10, 15 years ago. I think it is a higher inflationary one and I do pay heed to some of those hawkish comments and I do think the market is um, too optimistic really for the majority of the G10 central banks in terms of interest rate cuts. Jane, do you think that there is really any chance at all that either the Fed or the ECB could even hike rates further if there are material supply chain disruptions or if oil prices are materially higher? Um, you know, I'd like to say no, but I, I don't think, I think it would be food hardly to, to completely rule out that, uh, that chance because, you know, we just don't know what's going to happen on, say, the geopolitical front or the climate change front, and, you know, but I, I would say that the answer is probably not. But there's got to be a, you know, a slim chance. I, I would not want to say 100% certain that they would not hike interest rates again. So, Jane, let's wrap it up. Favourite trade for the year ahead. What is it? You know, I, I think sterling is going to um, do better um, than the market is anticipating. I, I think there's just too much uh, gloom uh, priced into the UK. It's almost become habitual for, for people like me to, to be really bearish on, on, on sterling. I think that's probably overdone. Um, I, I, I really don't like the euro, and, and this is uh, related to problems aside from the dollar. This is related to problems with the German economy. I, I, I think if inflation can be kept in check in the eurozone, I think Europe needs a softer euro, and I think that's going to be the case for the number of years, just to compete, you know, just to, just to increase its competitiveness uh, because of these issues, you know, with higher energy prices, um, etc. Uh, and of course, the yen is interesting. And you know, at the end of last year, everyone really was saying that the yen is going to be really, really strong. Uh, I, I think it will strengthen to some degree, but I think it will disappoint the bulls. Still waiting for those rate hikes. Jane, thank you. Good to catch up. Jane Foley there of Rabobank. Does not like the euro. I want to go back to what we heard from Kit Jukes of Sokgen this morning <laughs> on the German statistics office. They should stop publishing economic data. <laughs> Because, Lisa, it's been absolutely dreadful over in Germany. So they should have a uh, Communist Party of China uh, kind of response to a it. A CCP just, approach know, just, to economic transparency. Just basically youth unemployment, German uh, fundamental economic data. Here's the issue, is that how much of this is priced in, right? How much are people expecting some sort of resurgence in German industrial production? Where is the growth going to come from? Has that fully been priced in, or are people expecting that to somehow just shift back to the normal relationship between Germany and the rest of Europe? The German business model. Tom, celebrated for so long, has failed on several fronts. Yeah, and you see it sharp in the data yes. repeatedly. Yeah, uh, what you, the key word there, John, is several. It wasn't just one thing that made this unravel. What I hear from our experts is they continue to go back to the China uh, debate, the idea that the linkage of China with Europe is radically different right now. You see what Brahma just did? In the U.S. She dropped her tang. Poured water all down my suit. It was tang zero. I did no, not. It didn't it's sticky. Be careful. It's tang zero. It's, it's what is seltzer. It? It's seltzer. sparkling water. It'll wash out. Seltzer. It's not That's a big deal. New York it's okay. it actually, It'll dry. It, It'll dry. It's not a problem. Okay. I'm very cool. Relaxed. Yeah. <laughs> uh oh. Brooke Sutherland <laughs> is coming up on bone. <laughs> she's spilling. Don't wait. He didn't really. Just a little splash. Just a spray. Just, wait, you just want, a bit you of a spray. Another tang <laughs> zero? I got tang zero here right It's now. okay. I like seltzer. Boeing in yesterday's session. Biggest one-day drop going back to October 2022. Mm. A drop of more than 8%. <laughs> Boeing's worst day in more than a year. This morning, Boeing almost totally unchanged. But the spotlight, they can't get away from it. That conversation up next with Brooke Sutherland of Bloomberg.
We need to first and foremost figure out what happened here on this aircraft. If we have a bigger system-wide or fleet issue, we will issue an urgent safety recommendation to uh, uh, push for change. We are, don't know if there were bolts there or if they are just missing and departed when the door plug departed. The more they talk, the worse it sounds. That was Jennifer Homendi, the National Transportation Safety Board Chair, on the investigation into the panel blowout of Boeing 737 MAX 9. Alaska Air and United both finding loose bolts from a number of their MAX 9 fleet after preliminary checks. Just unbelievable. Boeing yesterday, bad day in this equity market. Biggest one day drop since the back end of 2022. This morning, Boeing is negative by something like 0.9%. But Tom, honestly, you hear from the airlines, it's not sounding right. great. You hear from the investigators, it doesn't sound too good. It's going to take a while to figure out what it's happened It's going to take here. a while. There's going to be an adult investigation and always new things come up in the investigation and critically things we assume are pushed aside by adult engineers. And there is a history of us really doing better than good at this, so there can be some optimism about the quality. There's three companies, though, Tom, I think we still need to talk about. There's Boeing, the Spirit Aero System, and then there's Alaska Airlines. And I want to work out, Tom, if there was a red flashing light that was coming up on that particular aircraft. Yeah, where was Alaska on that? Yeah. What was done about it yeah. and who was responsible to check it and follow up and make sure it was yeah. addressed? We're going to see in the first person that I thought of when I heard of this very serious failure, engineering failure, was the gentle lady from Kansas. Brooke Sutherland knows this cold. She's Bloomberg Opinion columnist, and she knows that Clyde Cessna in 1916 invented our aviation world in Wichita, Kansas. So we're going to go to Wichita right now and talk about how we actually build the things we take for granted. How shattered is Aviation Kansas this morning, Brooke? How, not afraid, but just how is their confidence broken? I think you have to be rather concerned in Wichita. I mean, that is the home of Spirit Aerosystems, um, which is the supplier that makes the fuselage on the Boeing Max. Now, this is not, uh, it's not clear yet if this was a Spirit issue, but they have had a history of quality control glitches just in this past um, year, really. And there's a lot of scrutiny over the relationship between Boeing and Spirit Aerosystems. This used to be a part of Boeing until back in 2005, executives decided they could boost their profit margins by focusing on design and outsourcing some of the actual manufacturing work. But this was really just a set of factories. This was never really meant to be an independent business. And I think this relationship is going to get a lot of scrutiny. There's been speculation of could Boeing buy Spirit Aerosystems. I think that would be very complicated considering Spirit has since diversified into contracts with Airbus and the military. But I do think both Boeing and Airbus down the road are going to look right. at vertically integrating more of that aerospace structure's work because it's just not a tenable relationship. Is this enough for Airbus to get a legit foothold into American aviation? I mean, I think they have one. What's interesting is that Aerospace, Airbus has remained much more vertically integrated than Boeing ever has. They've outsourced some stuff here and there, but they have not done it to the extent that Boeing did. And in hindsight, being 2020, that was clearly the right decision. I'm wondering the decision uh, by the airline companies of which planes to buy, why it is that United and Alaska Air had a disproportionate number of these particular jets. Is it just the routes that they decided to fly on? Was it just simply availability? Was it the cost? I mean, I think it's a little bit of both. The reality is we have a duopoly. It's Boeing and it's Airbus. And Airbus is sold out of its marquee narrow body jets into the 2030s. Um, I think, you know, depending on the routes you want to fly, fuel efficiency, engines are also a concern. So the MAX jet only takes the uh, engine from CFM International, which is the joint venture from Saffron and GE. Airbus, you can choose between that CFM engine or a variant of it or the GTF from RTX, which of course is having problems of its own. They've had to do a very costly recall of that engine technology because of, an, again, a manufacturing glitch that at that time involved powdered metal. So if you're an airline, I don't really know what your best option is because you're now having problems with both of these aircraft, but you don't have a lot of alternatives. The one thing we should say is that so far, all of the investigations, the grounding is really focused on the MAX 9. So that actually makes up a relatively small percentage of the overall operating MAX fleet um, and the order backlog. So the MAX 8 is really the workhorse 
um, of that Boeing family of jets. And that so far has not come under scrutiny, although it, it's a fair question I, as to whether it may at some point. George Ferguson of Bloomberg Intelligence was on yesterday and he was talking about how there have been some serious staffing issues since the pandemic. And that could play a role in some of these supply chain issues, or at least some of the uh, assembly line issues and the lack of assiduousness to tightening the bolts. Do you buy into this? Is this something that you've been hearing from other executives of industrial companies that they just do not have the quality or number of staffers to really make sure that things are done properly? Absolutely. I mean, I think if you look back to the pandemic, we bailed out the airlines, but we did not bail out the aerospace <coughs> manufacturing supply chain, um, which was a very created a lopsided dynamic where these companies just laid off in mass and then they could not hire people back when they wanted to. Now, I would also put some of the blame, though, on these aerospace manufacturing companies because we have long had supply chain issues <coughs> um, in this corner mm -hmm. of the world. Even before the pandemic, companies were struggling to ramp up production to meet Boeing and Airbus goals. And so you would think that maybe these companies might have had some presence of mind to hold on to the workers. And I've written about the railroads who are making some structural decisions about not laying off workers when times get tough and whether we should see sort of a similar mindset yeah. shift in the aerospace world. I think that would be very necessary. I mean, Brooke, you're an expert at this. In the last hour, I talked about Boeing and I looked at a fancy Bloomberg chart and I'm saying something happened starting on and around 2016. As simple as I can, did they lose the culture did they lose the engineering discipline when they exited Seattle? I think at this point, you have to look at deep-rooted cultural issues. I mean, it has been one problem after another at Boeing. And I know Dave Calhoun has been very resistant to conversations that this is a cultural problem. He's resisted more sweeping overhauls of the engineering ranks or management ranks or the culture there. But I think what's needed is a true reset. And I go back to GE because there are a lot of crossovers between GE and Boeing management over the years. That company went through a proper cultural reset and it is now on a much healthier path. It's breaking up, but it's uh, making money again. It's generating cash flow again. And it is overall a much healthier company. And I think that when you have these type of crises and especially when it's sort of something as basic potentially as screwing in the bolts on a door, you have to look at how did we get here and what sort of cultural norms are in place that would allow this type of thing to happen, allow planes to be delivered in this condition? Brooke, how resistant are regulators to that conversation? I don't think they should be resistant because I think their reputation is also on the line here. Now, remember that the FAA is supposed to be inspecting and checking every single MAX plane before it is handed over to customers. That was a protocol that was put in place in the wake of those two fatal crashes when it came out that that flight control software was much more prone to being triggered by malfunctioning sensors than regulators realize, and also a lot more powerful. Um, they, Their reputation as the FAA really took a hit in that accident, and this was meant to be part of their response to that. So the FAA also missed something here. Um, and so I think it should be in their interest to try to beef up scrutiny of Boeing and also the overall aerospace safety infrastructure. I mean, this is not the only issue that we've had. We've also had close calls on the runways. And I think we've gotten very comfortable as a country because we've been lucky enough not to have uh, very many fatal accidents in recent years. But you cannot get complacent about aerospace safety. But just quickly, where is your focus right now? Is it on Boeing, Spirit Aerosystems? The individuals that make the fuselage for the 737, is it on the carrier, Alaska Rare? Is it on the FAA? Where's your focus? Well, I, I would say all of the above because I follow all of those companies, but I think Boeing is the most important story here. How do they react to this? What types of changes do they make, whether that involves their supply chain, whether it involves management? Um, if you remember back in sort of mid-2022, there was an unusual number of Boeing customers calling for management changes. Now, that has since sort of quieted down, but I do wonder if in the wake of this accident that might start to pick back up again. Now, Boeing did name a chief operating officer uh, last month, Stephanie Pope, who's the head of their services arm, sort of making her the heir apparent to Dave Calhoun. I would keep an eye on, you know, whether any type of management changes happen sooner rather than later. But I would also say that this is a company that could really use some fresh eyes and maybe promoting from within um, <clears throat> might raise some more eyebrows. Interesting. Hey, Brooke, this was great. Brooke Sutherland there.
of Bloomberg Opinion. TK, the spotlight on Boeing. Maybe there's a general in a hospital in Washington that can find something to do with the Axis defense and take Lloyd Austin out there to straighten out Boeing. I'm just coming I'm up not, with an I'm idea. not going there. <laughs> I'm not going there. I'm coming up with I keep idea. going back to what I've said in the last 24 hours. I think we all wish him a speedy recovery. It's not said enough. Yes. It's just the problem is yes. we don't know what? what the recovery is from <laughs> still. Coming up next on this program, Emily Rowland of John Hancock Investment Management from New York City with equity futures at session lows. We're down about 0.5%. This is Bloomberg. The market's probably a little bit overdone or was overdone into the end of the year. People dashed into this market. They extended the expectations of rate cuts. Whether the Fed cuts with March or May probably is not that much of a big deal. Is that the Fed that is going to cut this year? I think that's what's important. The idea that the market's got five rate cuts priced in, six last week, five now, that might be wildly optimistic. I think there are a number of things that could come in and trip this market up a bit, but usually it's something the market doesn't see coming. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane <coughs> and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P session lows down a half of 1% on the S&P 500. TK following a pretty decent day of gains in yesterday's session. A lot of distractions so far this morning. Boeing and the rest. I thought Brooke Sutherland there was just absolutely outstanding on the challenges for the nation and for Boeing in that. But guess what? It's about the markets too. And we underplayed it in the last... Our, the market yesterday, John, is only one word, extraordinary. I mean, there's just no other way to put it. It was a true surge refuting a lot of the negativity of the first couple of days. Well, a decent bounce, decent rebound, led by tech and discretionary. On the discretionary side of things, a couple of retailers, Abercrombie, Lululemon, saying things were better in the fourth quarter, raising their outlook, Lisa. Then NVIDIA just has to come out and say, new products, and then we get a big rally. And the shares are up more than 6% on the day, leading this charge. To me, it just sort of speaks to the fact that everyone's looking for a reason to buy, and that any dip is buyable. Everyone's been saying it's going to be turbulent in the first couple of months or weeks or whatever, and then it's going to rally hard into the rest of the year. So you're basically seeing that yesterday, for example. UBS's David Lefkowitz came out, and he basically upgraded his outlook for the full year. So again, it's like even if there's going to be a sell-off. A week into the year. Exactly. All of the upgrades are kind of coming out. We got from Lori Calvacina basically bringing forward a so lot of from the Goldman price. before the year was yeah, out. Exactly. Yeah, Costin, <laughs> I thought, was really said, good. Yeah, about yeah. that forecast for next year, yeah, we'll pump that one up again. <laughs> but but this, this, this is important. What Lisa is talking about, folks, is not one or two opinions. I'm going to say it's almost consensus that consensus is wrong. Well, what is consensus at this point? If the consensus, I mean, single I'm, I'm digit. a little bit over Lo middle, uh, middle single double, digit is a negative. general statement. My point is, when you take a step back, people don't see any reason for the rally that we saw at the end of last year to stop. If there isn't going to be some massive recession, if the Fed's going to be cutting rates, isn't it time to party? And the only thing that's making people nervous, including the Federal Reserve, is that maybe things are getting too easy with conditions. But that's the reason why people are ready to come back in the second I, that they get the all clear. How signal. can you have too easy if you've got under 2% GDP, perhaps, or even 2.X% GDP? But to your point, we're not in recession. Tony Dwyer, among others, saying that's an important litmus test. Let's just frame the year-end forecast, the high 5,200, the low 4,200. It's still a 1,000 point spread between the likes yeah. of JP Morgan and people over at Oppenheimer. Like yeah. it's a massive spread. Let's get to the price action. The scores right now on the S&P 500. Lots to look forward to. At least we'll give you the day ahead in just a moment. We've got CPI on Thursday, bank earnings from JP Morgan and Bank of America on Friday, then a ton of banks the following week as well. Equity futures on the S&P session lows down about a half of 1% on the S&P 500. Energy names struggled yesterday. Crews back in back, bouncing back this morning up by 2.3% here, Lisa, 72.42. And oil is an important one to watch. The geopolitics politics of the moment could be the surprise that a lot of people are looking for uh, to disrupt at least the normal uh, that people are looking at right now. Today, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is continuing his tour in the Middle East, his fourth to the region since October 7th. He's in Tel Aviv today <laughs> after visiting Turkey, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates and Jordan. Key question around what potential escalations there are after the attacks at uh, the latest ones by Israel on Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. 12 p.m. We hear from Fed Vice Chair for Supervision Michael Barr talking about bank re regulation. I do want to hear what the 
uh, evolution of this BTP kind of program is, uh, what is it, BTFP, the, the sort of short-term funding that allows banks to not have to sell treasuries at a loss that's really helped keep up the uh, banking system. Do they continue that? I mean, that's a serious concern. What happens if they don't? Exactly. That's my point. I mean, does that sort of continue some of the disruption that we saw earlier this year? You need a pretty epic Treasury market rally to allay some concerns around that, don't you? Which is the reason why I'm watching the auctions. 1 p.m., the most important moment of the day. Treasury is planning to sell $52 billion of three-year notes. We get 10-year notes tomorrow, 30-year notes the following day. How much appetite is there at this point, especially given what we saw yesterday with inflation expectations for the next three years falling to the lowest since the pandemic started? Busy couple of days coming up. Lisa, thanks for that. Let's kick off this hour's conversation with Emily Rowland, co-chief investment strategist at John Hancock Investment Management. Emily, great to catch up with you. In in the last hour on Bloomberg TV, we spoke to Ben Lader of eToro, who referred to tech names as teddy bear stocks. You hug them, they help you sleep at night, they deliver decent gains, at least for him, <laughs> because he was long tech through most of last year. Emily, do you still like those so-called teddy bear stocks? Yeah, we were long tech last year as well, really as a function of our preference for quality. So we were looking for companies with great balance sheets, tons of cash, low interest burdens, and we still like tech stocks, but we've got to recognize the fact that the S&P 500 growth index is now trading at a 44% premium to its 20-year average. So tech stocks were up about 58% last year on about 5% earnings growth. Now, don't get me wrong, 5% earnings growth was of the best globally in the U.S. tech sector, but I think it makes sense for tech to potentially take a bit of a breather here. We're not downgrading it, but I don't know how much right. you can expect this year after such an extraordinary 2023. What are you doing on 6040? I mean, to me, this is a really important question. I've seen huge failure of some of the marketing concepts like target benefit programs and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. To get to an asset allocation, what do you do 6040 forward? I mean, what an incredible year in 2023 for a 6040 portfolio after a horrible 2022 was up about 18% last year. You know, when we look at it, and everybody was calling for it to be dead, right? The death of the 60-40 portfolio, clearly very much alive and well. When we look at it, we're modestly adding to our positions in fixed income. And it, to us, it's a math game. You know, you look on the stock side of the house, it's, you know, you're sitting at 19 and a half times forward earnings. You've got 12% yeah. earnings growth penciled in by analysts on the street. It's just a tough starting point. We're not saying equities will do horrible this year. It's just right. the, the bar is really high. And when you look at fixed income, you know, 4 or 5% on high-quality bonds, of course, there was a better entry point back in October. But we still look at the income on high-quality bonds as a great way to sit here, get paid to wait, as we might experience some more volatility as the lagged impact of Fed tightening does cause cracks right. to form in the economic picture and in the labor market. Is there such a thing as growthy value? I mean, I know you're going to tell me there's a partition <laughs> between value and growth, but if I'm upset with 30 multiples or 22 multiples, where's that growthy value where at least I can hide? Yeah, absolutely. So when we look on the value side, you've got to be really discerning because there's a lot of cyclicality inherently in value indices. So we're looking at areas that have a high quality element to them. So healthcare, for example, one of our favorite sectors. I know a lot of people have been coming on here talking about healthcare. It's trading at a 10 percent discount to the broad market. We think it's going to benefit as consumer behavior shifts, maybe we're not going to buy all the stuff we want. I know we were talking about athleisure earlier. By the way, I have an 11-year-old daughter. I'm here to tell you athleisure is alive and well. Um, but people are still going to do the things they need to do. They're going to go to the doctor. They're going to get medical care. Utilities, another area that got really, really hurt down you know, last year. Everybody left it for dead. It's trading at a 20% discount. So we could see a rotation into those sort of dogs of the Dow as potentially tech takes a breather into 2024. Emily, one thing I've really been struggling with in 2024 is what is the biggest risk? Is it a reacceleration of inflation or is it recession? Oh, that's the question of the year, I think. And, you know, I think as you're looking at looser financial conditions, this is going to be one for the history books, right? Was the Fed too dovish over the last two meetings, suggesting that cuts are coming in the summary of economic projections? Markets are pricing in five, six rate cuts this year. And of course, that's caused the loosening in financial conditions, which has been really spurring this pivot party that we've been talking about on the show 
uh, this year. Right now, the pivot party's feeling a little bit like maybe a hangover. Maybe we're like trying out dry January here or something as the markets are now back to this good news on the economic front, which is causing yields to back up, being sort of bad news on the equity front. So as far as recession goes, I think everybody's sort of tired of talking about it. And frankly, Matt Miskin and I don't really get paid on our views on whether recession plays out or not. We get paid on how we think about positioning into this environment. So maybe if it could, you know, we're prepared if an economic contraction takes place, again, leading into higher quality bonds, looking at income, and then rotating into these more defensive parts of the market that should benefit on a relative basis, if something breaks, if something breaks, and we do see that contraction play out. I guess that the way this folds into positioning is leaning into high quality income producing uh, fixed income. Does this really get upended if the economy is hotter than expected and if the pivot party, as you pointed out, has just (laughs) run way too far? Yeah, I mean, there is a potential here, you know, certainly for rates to chop around. We're watching energy prices closely, which could play into the inflation picture here. Of course, the data on Thursday on CPI is going to be, you know, critically important here. So there is a risk here that we see a reacceleration. It's just hard to imagine an environment where inflation goes back to the 9% that we saw in the summer of 2022. Obviously, there were some very unique sort of pandemic era dynamics there around supply chains, around fiscal stimulus. So we think that ultimately we go back to a low growth, low inflation, low rate environment, which really permeated the markets and the economy for much of the last decade. Nothing changed except we pumped five trillion dollars of stimulus into the U.S. economy. There's forces out there that are very much disinflationary. And we think over the longer term, that's where we go. And we're headed in that direction, certainly, as we start the year. Emily, I mentioned Ben later and he talked about the opportunities in Europe. Is the buy still America, U.S. stocks? It is. I mean, you guys have been talking a lot this morning about how horrible, for lack of a better word, the data is coming out of Europe and certainly in Germany. And it's interesting to see, you know, stocks really not reacting to that in in Europe. You know, there's been buoyancy, there's been participation, the weaker dollar has helped non-U.S. equities. But when we look to the U.S., we're holding up the best around the world economically. Our labor market is undoubtedly the strongest across the world. And earnings estimates here are more robust than they are in other areas. And then finally, we just have more high quality stocks here in the U.S. So we do still have a preference for U.S. equities over international, especially over emerging market equities, where we think China is going to be challenged into this year. Interesting. Emily, thank you. Emily Rowland there of John Hancock Investment Management, almost the total opposite of what we heard from Sharon Banner Goldman Sachs yesterday, Lisa, who was much more constructive on Europe and much more constructive about the global growth backdrop as well. This has to go to uh, really what's being priced in and also your view on China at a time where that really has been the slowdown that everyone knows about. And again, this goes to, okay, have we really understood the ramifications of that? And has that reached a trough? given right. that they're likely to inject some stimulus. The smartest thing I've heard in this in the last 12 months, 18 months, is a guy named Scott Galloway at New York University who's pretty good at thinking about this. And he extends the time frame, John, these cycles, these moods, China this, China that. Guess what? The optimism on tech, it's a 3, 5, 10-year phenomenon to Professor Galloway. Particularly around AI for so many people out there as well. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program on the S&P 500. We are negative here by 0.4% following a really, really decent day of gains on the S&P 500. Before that, last week was pretty rough. First weekly loss going back to October. People like Bramo talking about sober January. Sober January in the equity market, Lisa. Oh, yeah. Well, we just heard the same thing from uh, Emily Rose. That's why I mentioned it. Dry January. January. Yeah, just building on this feeling that we're all just depriving ourselves of the joy that we felt at the end of last year. In stocks running up and rallying. It felt (laughs) good for you, didn't it? (laughs) Sort of. I was just giving you your props. Thank you. I, I think Any that's, time I'm looking oh, out for you. That's really sweet. Bramo branded January in like the first two days of the month after a couple of days of losses, TK. <laughs> I didn't notice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You were talking to me. He's like, why are people hysterical? It's just notable because at least there were declines. I mean, the fact that it was yes. the biggest weekly decline going back to October tells you our uh, first weekly decline since October. It's actually more about the gains than the sell Exactly. We're totally on the same page. Daryl Cronk of Wells Fargo in the next hour on Bloomberg TV and radio to break down this equity market for you. With us around the table in just a moment, Bloomberg's Anne-Marie up from Washington, D.C., here in New York City, to try and help us find the Defense Secretary, Lloyd Austin. Her thoughts on that coming up next from New York, Equity Futures, Session Lows. Good morning. The 
2024 nominating contests are here, and the candidates are making their cases to voters in Iowa ahead of the caucuses. Bloomberg is live in the ground, bringing you the fastest news. Trump is leading by a long shot. Insightful interviews. And at the end of the day, that's what the American people want. And the most informative analysis about what it all means for November's presidential election. What is your path to the nomination? It all starts Monday in Iowa, only on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. I understand their passion, and I've been quietly working. I've been quietly working with the Israeli government to get them to reduce and significantly get out of Gaza, I'm using all that I can to do. Quite a scene. President Biden addressing the situation in Gaza after facing interruptions from pro-Palestine protesters during a speech in Charleston. More with Anne-Marie around the table here in New York in just a moment. I want to touch base on a price action. Equity futures on the S&P 500 negative here by 0.4% on the S&P. Really decent day of gains yesterday on both the S&P and the Nasdaq. The best day of gains going back to the middle of November. There's some data this week we can talk about. CPI inflation data <coughs> on Thursday. Some earnings to talk about as well. You'll get numbers from JP Morgan, Bank of America on Friday. Then all the other banks, TK, to kick off next week. It's going to be interesting to say the least. A deserved video vacation for Emery Hordener, Bloomberg, Iowa, New Hampshire correspondent. You're getting ready for the festivities to begin. I'm thrilled that she's back with us. Emery, I'm going to cut to the chase and, and just say there's so many different stories, but this war or that war or both wars just won't go away for this president, will they? They won't go away for this president, and we see this urgent trip from, from Secretary Blinken over to the region to try to quell some of these concerns. And you don't just see it in on the international pages of the newspaper anymore. The president yesterday is in South Carolina trying to shore up a key voting block. We're seeing softer numbers in the polling when it comes to the black American community, the African American community. And while he begins that speech talking about the threat of democracy, he's hit with protesters talking about Gaza and what is going on in Israel. So it's a huge concern for this administration. On top of that, as John mentioned before the break, what's going on is shining a lot of light on the foreign policy apparatus because there's a lot of questions remaining about what is going on with Lloyd Austin, his defense secretary. Well, let's get into that. Who's running the Pentagon right now? I think that would be his deputy at the moment. Well, technically he is. Uh, Brigadier General Pat Ryder came out and said he is now out of the ICU and he will be running it. But for two days, it was the deputy. And not everyone knew that. Only a small group of people within the Pentagon knew that until the chief of staff told the White House and told top members of Congress about Lloyd Austin's condition. I think a lot of us find this absolutely unbelievable, astounding. Terry Haynes of Pangea was on this program an hour ago, and he was basically calling for the resignation of the Defence Secretary. Where I find things to be really, really confusing, and I'm wondering if any of your reporting can give us some colour on this. When you have the kind of terrorist attack that we had last Wednesday in Iran, and the kind of questions that people were asking about the prospect of a broader war and things escalating in the Middle East, are we sitting here and concluding that the likes of Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor to the president, the White House, didn't speak to the Pentagon on Wednesday? And if they did, they weren't aware even then where the defense secretary was. Well, there was a strike in Baghdad, and Brigadier General Pat Ryder said that that was a discussion Lloyd Austin had with the president before he went back to the hospital for this emergency and went to intensive care, was taken by an ambulance. But yes, for 48 hours, the question is, who were they speaking with? Um, you know, there's real time tracking of these people. They're supposed to be in the situation room. So there's a lot of questions regarding how this administration operates. There was a lot of questions after the fall of Kabul about intra-agency and communication within different agencies within the administration, which many believe led to the failure of that withdrawal of U.S. troops and personnel from Afghanistan. And it seems that potentially they didn't learn those lessons of intra-agency communications. A lot of criticism on this White House of how they're very insular within. We need to understand a lot more what happened, and I'm sure that we will learn more in the days and weeks ahead, or I hope that we learn some more. In the meantime, there's also this question about Lloyd Austin being a very private man, and he was known in Washington, D.C., as trying to really keep a lot close to his chest. 
Is that sort of a theme throughout the Biden administration, that people who are in public positions that are setting policy and really, uh, you know, close to the presidency in line are private people that are not present enough in the public eye? Well, when you get one of these jobs, you can kiss your private life goodbye. That just doesn't happen. Obviously, there's some things that are that are private, but going into the hospital, undergoing anesthesia. Again, we don't even know what this procedure he had done with. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming he had well, he went under anesthesia. These are things that need to be communicated. And Lloyd Austin has said that. He, he's come out with a statement about this. But there's growing calls in Congress. You're talking about Terry Haynes. You should see what Republicans are putting out there. Lee Stefanik wants his resignation. Um, some are saying that there should be an impeachment for Lloyd Austin in Congress, but even Democrats are saying more needs to be done. I'm looking at Senator Reid, uh, who's saying that there needs to be a full understand, understanding and accountability of this. Right. So the, if you take a step back, there's a question about whether they're going to find a fall guy within the Secretary of Defense or the, the Defense Department. And then there's a question of where the buck stops. Is this more a problem for the Defense Department or more a problem for the White House? I think it's both. But at the end of the day, the buck stops with the president. Voters will be going to the poll this year, this November. If they don't like what they see, they're going to vote about on it. Jack Reed, you mentioned of Rhode Island. This is not just another senator. Describe the importance of Senator Reed of Rhode Island well, to this debate over the general. Well, he's he's chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee. This is a Democrat. He's uh, but he, he served the nation in the military. He's yes. not just a normal politician. No, of course away. not. No, so he understands also what it means if you were what Republicans are calling this is a dereliction of duty. He understands what that truly means to someone who has served. I mean, I mean where does this go in the next 24 hours? I mean. And it's unfair to ask you this, but but to me, it's just extraordinary. The questions are not going to stop, especially as we see Congress come back and go into full session. And it's going to be an easy point for members of Congress to deflect when they don't want to answer questions about how they're going to continue funding funding the government um, and whether or not they're going to get a, a broader deal on national security concerns and the border deal. They're going to especially Republicans are going to want to easily reflect on this. Let's finish where we started. The president of the United States. It's an unpopular war between Israel and Hamas. At the beginning of that war, the president stood shoulder to shoulder with Israeli leadership and clearly has suffered in the polls as a consequence. How is he going to address that in the coming months? You've seen a change of approach from this administration off the back of those moves in the polls. You're not going to see that bear hug happen ever again. And this is what the president said yesterday to the protesters. I understand the, impa the passion. I've been quietly working with the Israeli government to reduce significantly and get out of Gaza. So all of these conversations that we have been talking about that are quote unquote private between the White House and Netanyahu. I think a lot more details of those are going to become public. MH, great to have you with us here in New York City. Emery Horde and there weighing in on the latest, Tom, down in Washington. A delicate time for the President of the United States. Oh, beyond a delicate. A lot of work to do I, this I, year, I, that's I for sure. I can't emphasize enough the Democratic response to this, John. This is not about Republicans going after the de Democrats' usual thing. This is a bipartisan, nuanced outrage. Well, there's also a real question about Democratic support for President Biden right now. And we keep talking about it. And everyone within the White House keeps saying, stop talking about it because we're not talking about it. And yet it's going to really become something serious heading into uh, November, given some of these polls and given where we are. I've really struggled with the communication of this White House. Haven't you? Over the last couple of years, there's occasions like these that are just absolutely bizarre. And we're not getting a sense of the play by play. And we're not getting a sense of someone coming out and saying, look, this is completely unacceptable. We're going to have this kind of inquiry. We're going to give you these details at this time. And, you know, we're not going to let this happen again. We're not the last administration, seems to be the approach of this administration, Tom. So you should be happy. That's the way they behave. That was the initial That's model. That's the way they okay, behave. Okay, that was the initial we're model. We're not them. Yeah. So you should be satisfied, okay. which means we have a different set of standards. It's just kind of like, that well, was no, the first hundred days. you're in the White House now, and this is what we expect. It's kind of weird. First 50 days, first 100 days. I mean, if the conservatives were thrown out in England and the labor took over, they'd have their first 100 days. Same kind of equivalency. Sure. And then you got to be yourself. I have to say, one thing that I keep hearing on the margins with people in the market is that uh, political crisis is becoming more and more in their focus in terms of a potential risk for 2024. And I always say, yeah, 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 that's what everyone always says, and then nothing ever happens. But this time feels a little different. 
based on what we are setting up for. Coming up on this market, Guy Lebeau of Jenny Montgomery Scott on fixed income. That conversation coming up shortly. And fixed income right now, just a quick check of the bond market for you. Yields higher by a single basis point. The 10-year, 4.04%. The two-year, basically unchanged at 4.38. In the equity market on the S&P 500, just a little bounce, a small bounce off session lows. We're negative here by 0.4%. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. Big bounce yesterday, fading just a little bit this morning. Good morning to you on the S&P 500, negative. Just off session lows, we're down on the S&P by 0.4%, down by 0.6 on the Nasdaq 100. On the Russell, the small caps down by a little more than 1%. Had a decent slate of earnings in the past 24 hours. Heard from a few retailers, Lulu, Abercrombie, things better. Heard from one financial services firm, Jeffrey things not great. And Lisa, that tees up earnings this coming Friday. Especially because Jefferies usually is the first. We do get JP Morgan and Bank of America on Friday. But Jefferies posted a 53 job to their earnings uh, for the fourth quarter based on a year earlier. That is dismal. They were saying, well, you know, it's just a trough year and we're going to see things get better. Well, they got to get better. Question is how much and whether that's really being priced in. We'll dig into those numbers in just a moment. Let's turn to the bond market, the two year, the 10 year, the 30 year, going into CPI in a couple of days time. C CPI Thursday, Tom, PPI Friday. Yields back above 4% in the last few sessions. We're just about holding on 4.04% on a 10-year. It's going to be interesting to see what CPI is. There's cross currents. If you look at ECO Go, one series is sort of flat to up. Another series is flat to down. I'm going to go back to Carl Weinberg Publishing this morning. Granted, it's on Europe and not in the United States. But the look back 12 months screws up the math. It was It's such a shock from where we were uh, 12 months ago. Let's go back to it's gonna be an Jane Foley of Rabobank, yeah. and we can talk about Europe. Bring up the euro. Jane Foley of Rabobank on this program in the last hour, TK basically saying Europe needs a weaker euro, given what's happening in Germany at the moment. <clears throat> Europe needs one. Well, you're going to have to see. And again, you may see this at Davos. Carl saying that Lagarde will make an appearance, as she always does. And you know what? Where else are you going to make a statement like, I'm done, you know, let's go? The sort of confusion of this year is really summed up by Sharon Bell and Jane Foley. Sharon Bell saying that actually a stronger euro is usually associated with better growth because it signifies a better backdrop. And then you have Jane Foley saying for an export perspective, you need a weaker euro. There is no agreement on the market response to any geopolitical or sort of macro trend. And that, I think, continues into 2024. That's the story for the euro. 109.35. Lisa framing things nicely for you. Let's get you some top stories under surveillance this morning. United Airlines and Alaska Air finding loose bolts similar to those thought to be behind Friday's blowout on a Boeing 737 MAX 9 jet. The carrier saying the issues were found during their own maintenance checks. All MAX 9 jets have been grounded for the time being. Boeing has since issued guidance guidance on what inspections are needed to prevent another accident. Yesterday, the stock was down 8%. Muted price action this morning, but I think we all said it a little bit earlier. The more you hear, the worse it sounds. And bigger questions about Spiro error systems and exactly who is responsible. Is it Boeing to be really overseeing some of the quality control, but also who's inspecting this stuff for the FAA? You brought this up earlier, and I was looking at the salary for FAA employees, and I'm wondering, at $100,000 on average, is that not enough to really attract people to stay there for long enough well, to actually make sure we're in a good place? We had a tour de force from Brooke Sutherland of Bloomberg Opinion, folks, and I would you know, forget about what she's talking to us way too early in the morning for her. But it's going to be fascinating to see what Brooke Sutherland writes in the next couple days about what the should, what the to-do is for this huge national problem. Agreed. More from the team here at Bloomberg through the day on Bloomberg TV and radio. Let's get to this story. Bill Gross saying 10-year treasuries are overvalued at 4%. The PIMCO co-founder going on to post on X the following. 10-year treasury X. inflation protected Twitter. securities at 1.8% is the better choice if you need to buy bonds. I don't. He made millions late last year after betting the Fed would pivot to cuts this year and warning the bond market was misguided in August. Another bad turn, Lisa, from the former bond king. Okay. So here's my question. Is this just going to be uh, sort of the nuance, the sort of trading of the range, or is this some kind of big, bold call? Essentially, people are just saying trade the range because there's nothing exciting that's going to happen in the near term because we just don't know yet because of the economic data. Dovetail it with Jim Bianco yesterday, looking for price down and yield up uh, as well. And there's a heated battle out there. And on the other side, I, I mentioned this early in the morning, Priya Misra 
with a 10-year inflation-adjusted yield, as Mr. Gross mentions, tips of, I'm going to call it 1.XX percent, but I believe Misra of J.P. Morgan was talking about a real yield going from a 180 in the vicinity of 1.00 away from the gross call. Priya mentioning that once you get a 4% on the nominal yield, you start to see buying come in. She was saying that just last week. 10-year, 4%, that's a buy. A lot of people think that that's a buy. Right now, 4.04%. I want to get to the earnings. We mentioned them briefly. The numbers from Jefferies reporting a fourth quarter drop in profit as the deal slump on Wall Street continues. The bank's parent company posting earnings of $66 million. That's down from 140 a year earlier. Results also weighed down by a 64% drop in asset management and declining advisory fees. Wall Street's biggest banks set to report on Friday with JP Morgan City, Wells Fargo and Bank of America on deck. Not a great start, Lisa, for the financials. So I dug up some numbers and Bain put this out. The global M&A was on track in 2023 to fall about 20%. If you take a look at uh, just private equity <coughs> and venture capital, it was down uh, some near 40% year on year. So this is the kind of comps that you're looking at that probably did. I don't know, at least punch a hole um, in some of the bank's earnings. Let's get to a fixed income debate and continue with the conversation forward. Guy Labaz joins right now, Chief Fixed Income Strategist, Jenny Montgomery Scott, Philadelphia. Guy, thank you so much for joining uh, this morning. Just simple, let's begin with a call. Yields lower or higher this year? Marginally higher in the short term. But I think the, the broader theme we're seeing right now is there's some structural changes in the market led by larger treasury markets, more power from trend following CTAs to influence the level of interest rates. And so we're likely to see periods of call it four to eight weeks of consistently trending interest rates. And we expect over the next four to eight weeks, those, those consistently trending interest rates are towards the high side. Do you clip a coupon this year or like last year, there were some real pockets of total return out there in fixed income. Can you redo that this year? It's going to be a lot harder. Uh, you know, as we went into 2023 last year, credit spreads were relatively wide. Uh, we were still sort of uh, reeling from the late year risk off theme across a range of markets. But right now, as we sit at the beginning of 2024, the reality is that credit spreads are really near their recent heights. Uh, investment grade spreads are just a hair above 100 basis points. High yield spreads are inside of 350 basis points. And so it's really hard to generate big excess returns in that world. Uh, we think it's going to be more about surfing those waves of fee of trending interest rates, again, sort of in a four to eight week period throughout the year, as CTAs, those momentum based traders, go all in long and all in short, respectively. This is what we keep hearing from a lot of people, Guy, that this is sort of a trade the range kind of year. What does that mean in terms of volatility? Does it mean that it's actually less volatile because people are looking to just come in and take the other side when things start moving too far in one direction? Yeah, we, we consider volatility predominantly a feature of the uncertainty of the policy landscape. And the Fed policy landscape is, is becoming a lot more clear. You know, again, to, to recall where we were about this time last year, we were uncertain as an investment society whether we were looking at further 50 basis points, 75 basis point, or even something else, clips of Fed rate hikes. You know, right now that theme is a lot, lot calmer. And so I don't suspect that short term volatility is going to be all that prominent an issue. I would also say that over time, as the CTA uh, momentum type uh, trade trader investors become sort of chopped up, uh, we're expecting kind of disappointing returns from that sector in 2024, they'll also start to see capital pull back and they'll become less of a force in markets as the year progresses. But right now, it's definitely that, that trade, the th trade the trend, I should say, rather than the range. Guy, what do you think is the biggest risk for 2024? The risk of recession or the risk of reaccelerating inflation? Well, I would argue right now it's certainly reaccelerating inflation. This, of course, comes two days before the, uh, the first CPI release this year, referring to December. Uh, we have a really big expectation as an investing society of moderate in inflation. And as we've seen in the last year or so, there can be a lot of surprises just brought about by noisy data. The fact that we're measuring inflation once a month when inflation is really a process that takes place over right. time. And that could prove enough to spook markets, even though it's not really all that meaningful in the intermediate term. Good guy, over, th good guy, over three years, we have had a brutal bond market. Price down, yield up is a generalization. We've made some recover. I get that. Are Jenny Montgomery Scott bond clients healed from that debacle, or are they still living it? 
Yeah, that's a really good question, Tom. What I'll say is that our clients, quite independent from the advice we offer, they tend to shade right now towards shorter term bonds. Uh, and that could include things as short as money market funds. So I think the reason is not just the experience of the last few years, 2022 in particular, in which we yeah. saw double digit drops in market values, mm -hmm. but it's also relative yields, right? The front end of the yield curve still, if you just measure today's yield, offers a right. lot more carry than going out to the seven to 10 year portion of the yield curve, about 125, 150 basis points more. Carry. Who's going to destabilize this on issuance? Is it going to be corporate issuance that, that, that makes things uncertain? Or can it be Yellen and what she may do with government paper that Lisa talks about so often? Yeah, we're not looking for a huge slug of corporate issuance in 2024. Um, you know, of course, we're saying this right the week when, uh, when bank earnings come out and corporate issuance starts to really ramp up for the year. Uh, and in addition, when you look at the Treasury's issuance plans, they've really ramped up the portion of bill issuance. Uh, and I think that kind of does a little, a little bit of a limit uh, to the supply concerns that were so prominent in the August through October timeframe. So, so I really doubt we're going to get a big increase in longer term issuance supply. It's going to be more about bills in the front end. I'm not hugely concerned about supply as a big theme this year, more focused on CTA positioning, as we talked about in the first couple of moments of the segment, as a really determinant of the level of interest rates in the short term. Okay, we're, all, we're always talking about that moment of reckoning for the budget deficits, a conversation we've been having for a long, long time. Michael Semblis, the brilliant Michael Semblis over at JP Morgan, wrote about the boiling of the frog, that at some point between now and 2030, we've got to have that day of reckoning. My word's not his. He talks about the CPO projections that by early 2030, all federal government revenues will be consumed by entitlement payments and interest on the federal debt. Guy, do you see that day of reckoning on the horizon anytime soon? Well, I'll say those comments or similar ones have been a feature of markets for as long as I have been involved in them. Um, I don't have any detailed opinion on when that, uh, that, that, that day of reckoning, to use your phrase, is likely to arrive. I'm not even confident it does. But I will say one thing, high levels of nominal GDP growth through something like a big boost in economic productivity, even through marginally higher inflation over the course of a five or 10 year period, I'm talking 50 basis points higher inflation, not percentage points higher inflation. Both of those things would do a great deal to reducing the size of the deficit, reducing the size of the treasury markets as a portion of the economy. Governments don't generally pay down debt over time. They usually inflate it away. And that strikes me as the most likely outcome over a five or a 10 or a 20 year period here. Guy, appreciate your balance view as always. Thanks for joining us. Guy Labada of Jenny Montgomery Scott on this Treasury market. Lisa, we've been having that conversation for a long time long time. This one analyst on uh, Twitter or X put this out earlier this morning. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing people the government actually paid back their debts. <laughs> Talked about, what yeah, just said, right? It's essentially yes. like, not going to happen. They're not going to pay it down. It's the whole inflating it away. And so at what point was the inflation of the post-pandemic era a gift to the United States? And how much was it offset by the amount of issuance that the U.S. did? Well said, Bramo. If you are just joining us this morning, welcome to the program. The S&P 500 is negative by 0.4%. Yields are higher by a single basis point, 4.04% on a 10-year. Coming up a little bit later this morning, 8.30 Eastern Time, the brilliant Neil Dutta of Renaissance Macro, one of the best forecasters of this economy last year, Tom, for much of last year. And then later on this morning, right. in the next segment, actually, we'll catch up with Ian Bremer of Eurasia Group on their top risk, Tom, for 2024. What a gloomy set of top risks. Bremer just outdoing himself this year with a real caution that's within the global system, the geopolitical system right now. It's not a normal top risks at all. And Neil Dutta, his chart's out there right now. Real wage growth is tangible. That's the core Neil Dutta chart. That's the big call. Thinks it's supportive of discretionary spending. And yeah. Lisa, that was one of the leading sectors on the S&P 500 yesterday. Given the fact that Lululemon really had their uh, pop in sales, and we heard Emily Rowland there leaning into this whole idea. Okay, so what's the cutoff in terms of pricing, though, to buy stretch pants for your children. I am not sure. I, that's what I kept thinking Every about. Every time as you you've brought it. up Lulu, you've smiled. Well, How much money did you spend at Lulu? You know, it's not that I, I you know, I don't want to disclose anything. I think okay. that that's really private. And I think I'm well, you're not giving it, it away at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's 130 pair, you know, dollars for a pair of stretch pants. And okay. you have to wonder, you know, if you've got like a 10 year old who's going to grow out of them. Oh, right. Yeah, that really? sounds ridiculous. But that's my yeah, point. That sounds ridiculous. That's what I'm saying. No, I was it's thinking more personal. about your sales. No, I'm, I'm, no. I'm, I'm fine. Did you go into the sales? Were the sales good at Lulu? 
<laughs> I didn't go. No, you didn't go. Okay. <laughs> Every now. Of course you didn't. All right, sure. All right. <laughs> Lisa didn't go. Equity futures on the S&P 500. Just slightly negative. This is Bloomberg. Our strong preference is that the Houthis get the message that they're receiving from countries around the world that this needs to stop, and that's what we're focused on. It's clearly not in the interest of anyone, Israel, Lebanon, Hezbollah for that matter, uh, to, see this, uh, to see this escalate and to see an actual conflict. And the Israelis have been very clear with us that they want to find a diplomatic way forward. That was U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken addressing the situations in the Red Sea and the rising tensions in the Middle East, continuing his shuttle diplomacy trip in the region. Amazing to hear that, see what's taken place over the last three, four months, and then see this in the commodity market. Pull up the board and check out crude. WTI, Brent crude, still incredibly low given what's happening in the world at the moment, TK. WTI is 72.48. Do you remember the calls for triple-digit crude by Halloween yeah. in September? Yeah, EM, EM, you know, up, up, up and all that. And arguably things got worse in the Middle East, not better, and yet here we are at 72.50, and arguably perhaps because production yeah. in America is north of 13 million barrels a day. With our vast U.S. Phenomenal. oil policy. Phenomenal. <laughs> I would say Scotland has a better oil policy than we do, or at least they have one identifiable. John Farrell has made it clear we're stop saying Happy New Year's. What day did we cut that off? Uh, January 5th. And today is January yeah. 9th, I believe. And what we know for certain is Ian Bremmer and all of Eurasia Group have to rewrite their top risk for 2024 on January uh, 9th. That's how fast things are happening. He is here today with the top risk. What a grim set of risks in an election year. How uncertain is it to get to March or to get to, say, the middle of May? Well, first of all, Happy New Year, Tom, and to all of you here at Bloomberg <laughs> Surveillance. So nice to join you uh, as we kick off 2024 on January 9th. Uh, no, I, I don't think we have to rewrite uh, these, these risks, uh, but I think we have to recognize uh, just how incapable we, the United States, and our, our present set of global leaders are in trying to contain uh, the geopolitical risks and conflicts that we face today. You just saw we, the, the entry we had Blinken uh, standing there in the Middle East uh, saying they need to understand. We, we need them to understand. The Houthis need to understand. They need to stop this. He could have easily said the Hamas needs to understand they have to let these hostages go. The Israeli war cabinet needs to understand that they can't continue to expand um, the, the fighting in the region. The United States has zero ability um, to actually make those messages land with the actors on the ground right. who are escalating okay. this conflict. Triangulate this right now with Fareed Zakaria's essay in Foreign Affairs magazine in his post-American world and the Bremer post-American world. You say the U.S. is battling itself. That sounds a lot like Zakaria 20 years ago. Triangulate right now the lack of confidence you have in our U.S. geopolitical strategy. Uh, it was about 12 years ago when I first came up with this idea of a G0 world uh, where the United States was not going to be willing and able to be the global policeman, the architect of global trade and the promoter of global values, but that no other country or group of countries would be able to step into its place. And that as that geopolitical recession played out, there would be more conflict there would be more vacuums that would be filled by rogue actors who take advantage of the comparative chaos, of the lack of leadership. 12 years of that uh, gets you much bigger and unmitigated fighting. Uh, it, it, we see that with Russia, Ukraine, started in 2014, nobody really pushed back, and now we are here in 2024, and that war is turning trajectory in a way that none of us are comfortable with uh, in the West. You see that in the Middle East, uh, and that is set to expand significantly, and we see in the United States itself uh, that we are increasingly a tribal, non-functional democracy in crisis. Uh, very simple point. When you have the former Secretary of Defense under Trump saying this man is a threat to democracy, that, that, he was in charge of American national security under Trump. When you have the person who is running having tried um, to subvert a free and fair transfer of power, doing everything in his power to do so, in a functional democracy, that would be 
the number one issue of the election. Nothing else would be close. So is it that we're somehow getting our facts wrong? Or is it that the United States is not a consolidated functional democracy? Because there, there, there ain't no other advanced industrial democracies. No one else in the G7 is having the problems in legitimacy of its political institutions that the United States is experiencing in 2024. What do you think Those it is? Those are ours. What do I think? What which do you is? think it is? Do you think it is a functioning democracy? No, no, I think it's a hybrid system. I think it, the U.S. De democratic institutions have significantly eroded over the course of the past several decades. We have normalized that because all of the things that are unprecedented as they happen, and we, we still live here in the United States, we're basically saying, well, okay, I guess that's the way it works now. So impeachment doesn't work and we can impeach someone twice and they can still run again. I guess that's the way it works. You can have 91 indictments and I guess that's the way it works. You can post and say things that you never would have heard. I guess that's the way it works. Now, in, as set against the context of the world's most powerful, very functional economy and the world's most functional, very powerful global defense capacity, you'd say, well, maybe it's okay that the United States isn't a functional democracy, but it will be different. And so, yeah, I, I think we can't normalize the dysfunction of the U.S. political system, the illegitimacy of its institutions, and the fact that democracy in 2024 in the United States is in crisis. That, that is the reality. And, and our allies know that. They're deeply worried about it, all of them around the world. Um, and our adversaries see this as potentially a huge opportunity for themselves. So where do you see us 12 months from now? What do things look like? Well, I, first of all, let's talk about March, April, May. Uh, Tom said, do you need to completely rewrite this uh, then? Uh, when Trump gets the nomination, which is very, very likely, he will overnight become far more powerful on the U.S. and the global stage all of the Republicans will be loyal to him in a way that right now they still have hedging capacity. Um, and the media that is following and supporting Trump and the ability to raise money to drive that campaign. And that means his policy pronouncements, like there would never be a war against Israel if I was president because I showed the Iranians, I announced that assassination of uh, Qasem Soleimani. Well, that's gonna be the policy for Trump and therefore the Republicans. Zelensky, corrupt, I'd end this war in a day. I'd show him what's what. I'm not gonna give him billions and billions of dollars on the back of the American taxpayers. That becomes the policy. So the Overton window, right, of what is an acceptable policy frame debate in the United States is gonna change very dramatically when Trump becomes the nominee. Again, assuming that, it's not given, but assuming that. Um, and in 12 months time, uh, there's, there's, the stakes are a lot higher for both leaders than they ever have been before, right? So if, if Trump wins, uh, Biden and many, many people around him believe that they will face legal jeopardy, that, that Trump will politicize the well, FBI, the DOJ, the IRS, and go after them in a McCarthyite well, you know, prioritization of policy, where Trump, of course, faces potential prison time. So the stakes are much, much higher than we saw in 2020. Just quickly, Ian, is Biden the antidote to this at a time where we're, there are real questions around the defense uh, secretary and his absence, his undisclosed hospitalization, and the sense that President Biden is not very popular and isn't really addressing that? I was a little surprised uh, that we had no idea where the Secretary of Defense was uh, for several days in the middle of a war. That usually happens in China. It doesn't happen in the United States. Yeah, I know. I discussed that with an official yesterday, and he kind of had a chuckle over it. It's exactly um, what I said yesterday. Yeah. Is it really? I yeah. missed that. Was I this said, the official you talked to <laughs> yesterday? Good man. No, no. This is a Chinese official. But it was pretty funny. We all had a good chuckle over it. It's not, not what you want to see. Look, um, I, I think that Biden uh, has the intention of being the antidote. He wants to follow rule of law. But, I mean, we're in the fourth year of the Biden administration, and the country, the reality is the country is more politically divided. Our institutions are weaker today than they were when Biden became president. So he does not have the ability um, to resolve the divisions in the United States. Look, you look at Russia and Ukraine today, and you'd say that Zelensky would like to end the war. But he doesn't have the ability to do that, right? And that, that's the problem. We have these major conflicts geopolitically between Russia, Ukraine, uh, between Israel uh, and Hamas, and between the United States and itself. And in none of these cases is diplomacy an option. And in none of these cases do the principals have the ability and the willingness to stop the fighting.
that that's what 2024 is. That, that is, when I look ahead in 12 months' time, that's sure. where we are. That's what G0 means. Always an interesting read. Thanks for joining us, sir. It's good to catch up. Ian yeah, Bremer if you're Asia Group, Happy TK, the Once biggest again. risk <laughs> is the United States <laughs> itself. Oh, you, you won't come back yeah. now. That's, that's okay. It. I will. <laughs> in February, I'm going to say <laughs> Happy New Year. I'll, I'll make sure you Next week in Davos, back. I'll see you that's Happy it. New Year. That's what I'm going to keep doing. I don't think you're with us in Davos. I'll make sure that's not the okay, case. Okay, that's right. From New York City, futures on the S&P, slightly negative. We're down a third of 1%. the peak in interest rates. Investors do not want to miss out this time. I do think the Fed is a little frustrated by the fact the market always must be more dovish than the Fed wants. The longer that gap increases between when the Fed should start to cut, how quickly they cut, I think the odds of a hard landing start to increase. There is no soft landing in this economy right now. I mean, that's kind of wishful thinking. The Fed is trying to do the impossible right now. My heart goes out to them. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. Bloomberg Surveillance, as we were coming on to air, Lisa Abramowitz on the phone with her broker, looking at BitDog. Bitcoin in her retirement plan looks good. It's upon us. And uh, wait, we want to talk the markets here, John, and all that's going on in the surveillance world. And to me, it's one big distraction, except it's here. I mean, today, Eric Beltunas of Bloomberg potentially here. saying potentially, potentially here. Uh, Bitcoin ETF is there. Gary Gensler out with an extended thread with all the risks involved. You put those risks overlaid on the risks in the market, it's a risky 2024. Well, let's talk about financial markets of the last week or so. Lisa and I have been talking about this for a while, just the conflicting data, Tom, the conflicting yeah. economic data, the conflicting earnings stories as well. So you can identify a slowdown in ISM services. The number looks terrible on Friday. <coughs> Maybe you're starting to worry about what's going to happen to the broader economy. And then companies like Lululemon come out, Abercrombie and start upgrading their outlook off the exactly. back of that. Companies yeah. like Nvidia release new products. The appetite for them, we're expecting it to be through the roof. The stocks start rallying. The equity market bounces back. It's kind of been the story of the last 12 months. Four, five, six trade days here now we, we could go back we could go down three more days you know we could have another January two three four here down down we go boom up like yesterday and it just shows the immense uncertainty out there overlaid on top of the Bitcoin advent that seems to be imminent I'd put it this way Tom soft data versus hard <clears throat> data lots of people have reached out to me about that the survey data is not fantastic particularly manufacturing hasn't yeah. been for a long long time yeah. if you look at the hard data though things are okay Jobless claims still around 200K. And if you had to pick out right. a single data point to understand the health of the labor market over the last 12 months, claims would probably be it. Yeah, and Lisa Michael Feroli at JP Morgan writing Friday, yes, the job report was actually everything considered constructive and optimistic. And yet half of America seems flat on their back, particularly when you look at our political debate. What I find fascinating is we're at a moment where the market's moving faster than the Fed would like and the Fed's trying to jawbone it back. And you saw this with Michelle Bowman reiterating this concept that maybe because people are getting enthusiastic about bonds and stocks once again, that could actually force their hand and cause them to stay higher for longer. So I keep going back to this one main question, which is, which is the bigger risk for this year, a recession or a reignition of inflation? Right. And that to me, I don't think is quite clear. All we can do is look at the data, John. I'm going to start with the 10-year inflation adjusted yield now up to 8, 1.81%, 1.81%. Uh, that was like a 170. It's elevated here with some tension to it. And again, people looking for a return to a higher real yield challenging for uh, corporate America, or like Priya Misra of J.P. Morgan said, a shockingly low uh, real yield within the disinflation she predicts. Let's check out nominal yields right now on the 10-year, just north of 4%. Priya Misra of J.P. Morgan <laughs> saying 4% on a 10-year that's a buy. We just about held that level over the last week or so, 4.04%. In the FX market, the euro <coughs> slightly weaker, 109.38. If you've got data out of Germany, you know it's bad. It was bad. Industrial production, not great at all. That currency pair negative, 0.1%. And on the S&P 500, following the biggest one-day yeah. rally since the middle of November, we pulled back just a little bit, TK. It's early days. We're down 0.4%. Add a minute or two to the conversation here, because the last time he was on, we got a huge response of what to do with your money. Daryl Crockett, Chief Investment Officer, Wealth and Investment Management, is Wells Fargo. 
time stopped the last time you were on, and it had to do with the 60-40 bang up 2023. Instead of what's the view forward, what are you hearing from Wells Fargo institutional and retail clients right now? What are they doing with trillions of cash? What are they doing with their Magnificent Seven? Well, actually, they're still sitting on a lot of cash. Um, they're still parked in that 5% money market fund. They really haven't started to come back off the sidelines with any aggression at this point, notwithstanding the fourth quarter. We know that the 60-40 portfolio, to your point, went up 10.3% in the fourth quarter alone, right? I mean, that is huge, and the whole year was 17% when you took 26 on the S&P and 5.5 on the Barclays Ag. So, but I think they're a little bit cautious here as we start the year. I think, the, I think when you get below the data, Tom, you need to look at where the strength has come from, and is that strength continuing right. or is it deteriorating? My essay of the year, Lawrence McDonald, he's coming out with a new book, folks, Larry McDonald, just walking through the dynamics of the trillions and trillions of dollars of cash. You've got a whole team looking at this. Well, how is the cash going to unfold this year, stay in cash, move to bonds, actually move into the marginal Apple share? Yeah, so... I Basically, there's $6 trillion sitting in money funds, right, that we know of that has to go somewhere. The fourth quarter ignited that whole conversation of does it come back in the equity market? Does it go into longer duration uh, fixed income? We're starting to see some of that, but I, at 404 on the 10-year, we don't think that's a great buy at this level. We think north of 4.5%. In fact, we were long duration through much of the back half of the year that served us well in the big fourth quarter rally. Um, people forgot how bond math works and convexity works, right? Lisa would remember this well, right? Um, but, but look, I, I, you still have to look at, you know, when you look at where strength came from as we closed out the year, it came from the labor market, to your point. It came from the consumer. And it came from small business. We got the small business uh, uh, independent survey this morning, the NFIB, ticked up one point. But if you get below it, small businesses are still saying, I'm having a hard time finding labor. Credit conditions are too tight. I'm having a hard time refinancing. And prices are still going up on the cost of my inputs, right? So small business isn't feeling great. I'm going to take the other side of Friday's non-farm payroll report, right? So when you get a layer down, the fourth quarter of the year, 165,000 new jobs averaged. Right? That's the lowest average quarter for this cycle, period. 3.7% wage growth, lowest wage growth since 2019. Right, So it's decelerating. So that strength in the labor market isn't there anymore. And if I look at the consumer, take the University of Michigan consumer uh, sentiment, 69 Right? The long-term average is 86, right? So why isn't the consumer feeling better when the labor market is held up, when GDP is run above trend, when you know, they, they basically are able to spend money at, at their will? It's, it's starting to erode under the surface. and I don't think enough people are paying attention to it. It's certainly not built into the consensus. Should I follow how they feel or follow what they do? Because retail sales are still pretty decent. Retail sales have been pretty decent, but again, on a downward trajectory, right? I mean, you're going to get... The first half of this year, if you take consensus, the U.S. GDP is going to be certainly sub one, it looks like. And if you take the consensus you know, on Bloomberg, it's 0.1 for the first quarter, 0.2 for the second quarter. So this That's dangerously bonds, close. Right? Except you're not saying buy bonds. So what are you saying? Well, we actually think that you can be patient on the duration so you live on the short side of the curve right now. It's still the highest yields on the board. You play a little defense here. Right, because you are going to get better buying opportunities out into the first quarter, probably the next 30, 60, 90 days. When I look at sentiment, to your point, and positioning, right, the AAII survey is a full standard deviation above its long-term average, so sentiment is extremely bullish. Positioning is back at bullish peak levels, right? Usually those are areas you want to fade and be a contrarian in that kind of environment. Doesn't mean the whole year for 2024 is bad. It just means you're going to get better entry points than you probably have today. So we would caution and warn a little bit of patience here. The consensus heading into this year seems to be single digit returns for yes. the S&P. That is very rare, and that's something that people don't talk about. We very rarely get single-digit returns, positive or negative, on the S&P. And I'm wondering where the biggest potential surprise could be. And I've been asking this all morning because I've really been struggling with it. Is it an economic downturn, or is it the opposite? Or is it something political? Is it something that's really not in our radar right now? 
I actually think it's the economic downturn that's the biggest risk that's not priced into markets, right? Because again, you have to be a little bit of a contrarian here. The entire macro consensus is soft landing, Fed rate cuts, we've slayed the inflation beast, and we're going to get 11.5% earnings growth this year out of the S&P, right? Good, 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 right? We've got that built into the consensus. Now, if anything kind of comes off the rails, wherever it comes from, geopolitics, the domestic political situation, slower economic growth, all of those have, a, have an opportunity to change that positioning. And I think that's, as an investor, what you have to be cognizant of and prepared for. One thing that I've been picking up from people as they talk today and yesterday and earlier this year, last week, uh, is the threat of oil prices. And if there is some sort of disruption, oil prices go up, supply chain costs go up, that could create a really difficult situation that could really spur some sort of more significant downturn. Is that something you're watching too as a trigger point? So I think the interesting thing there is not, I mean, we've lived at $100 oil and it hasn't been economically derailing, right? Um, but going from $72 oil back to 100 would sure put a bid back into inflation, right? And buy into that second wave of inflation. Inflation often comes in waves. You know, let's admit we probably have finished the first wave of that inflation by where we brought it down to. We'll see the CPI report on Thursday. But if history is any guide, there's often a second wave behind it. And I think more importantly than inflation in itself, mm -hmm. which is a rate of change over any period of time, right? So let's not think about a 3%, 4% rate of change. What we've done is anchored prices at a high level that are not soon coming back down. Right. Mm -hmm. And that anchoring ends up, economically speaking, always grinds on consumers and businesses over time that that the longer you hold them there, the more it erodes things like sales, margins, earnings. Those types Let's of go to Magnificent Seven. When Wells Fargo took over A.G. Edwards, you got great <laughs> seats for the St. Louis Cardinals. Yes. And you also got a guy named Aaron Rakers, who's been really, really good on patience in Magnificent Seven Big Tech. He's modeling out Apple up 22% with a price target of 225. What is Mr. Ray Aaron Rakers and what do you say to people who say, look, you're telling me to sell the Magnificent Seven? What do you do with those once in a lifetime stocks? I don't think you can sell the Magnificent Seven. I mean, you, you got to dance with the one that brung you, right? <laughs> and tech and communication services brought you here, right? And I think they're going to continue to lead. Whether it's, you, you can develop your own narrative, and you guys hear it every day. You can say it's the quality trade. You can say it's the, 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 the fortress balance sheet and the free cash flow and all those types of things that are supporting these names. But the reality is that it is, right? And so you can't afford to be out of those names in this type of environment. We all know, the, you know that, that the Magnificent Seven and tech is 32% of the S&P 500, 40 year high, right? So you just have to be there. Um, now you can trim and take some profits if you've maintained that good exposure through 2023. There's nothing wrong now that we're new in a, in a new tax year with taking a little bit of profit and a little bit of capital off the table, playing defense and using that dry powder as we go out the next 30, 60, 90 days. Hold on to the teddy bears, Bramo. <laughs> teddy, those teddy bear stocks. stocks. I'd never yeah. heard that before. I mean, I'm just ben trying Nadler. to imagine Entire. someone cuddling with like teddy bear stocks, you know, Nvidia. an Alexa, and, and Nvidia. an iPhone, <laughs> and a little semiconductor. Hey, Dara, it's good to see you. You're to catch John. up. Thank, Thank you, you Thank sir. Dara Cronk there of Wells Fargo. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. The S&P 500 negative here, 0.4%. Coming up a little bit later, Neil Dutta for Renaissance Macro, 8.30 Eastern Time. The biggest risk for Daryl, a downturn in this economy. The biggest risk for others, a reacceleration. We'll talk to Neil Lisa about that in just a moment. Are the two the same? And this is sort of the interesting aspect. Could you get some sort of reacceleration in inflation that triggers the downturn since companies are more fragile after having higher rates, after already having a rollover in certain economic cycles? I mean, these are some of the things people are talking about. Are they the same kind of I, risk? I go to people like Aaron Rakers at Wells Fargo and securities analysis into a person they're talking about low, modest, single-digit earnings growth just seems off the mark when they come from the bottom up, John. Forget about the macro. Look at each company, and sure. there's this feeling there of a lift to where we are. A lift in this market yesterday, pulling back this morning. We're down by 0.4% on the S&P 500. In foreign exchange, the euro not doing much at all, 109.45 against the dollar. And in the commodity market, a rally here, up by about 3% on WTI. We'll talk about crude oil up next.
2024 nominating contests are here, and the candidates are making their cases to voters in Iowa ahead of the caucuses. Bloomberg is live in the ground, bringing you the fastest news. Trump is leading by a long shot. Insightful interviews. And at the end of the day, that's what the American people want. And the most informative analysis about what it all means for November's presidential election. What is your path to the nomination? It all starts Monday in Iowa, only on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. I think you've had a lot of supply, and, and as you pointed out, demand is decelerating. Certainly across the world, high interest rates are just putting some pressure on, on the economy and slowing it down. That, that's kind of our baseline for the year, slower demand growth. So that combination is, is I think, um, what, what's kind of pulling prices lower. And we just talk, we just cut our, our Brent forecast for the year to 80 average uh, WTI 75. We're kind of there right now. That was Francisco Blanche, the head of global commodities and derivatives at Bank of America Global Research, speaking to Manus Cranny and Danny Berger earlier on this week. Crude right now looks like this. Pull up the board and look at WTI. Still in the low 70s, 72.74, even with a move of almost $2 higher today up by 2.8%. We just keep going back to the same story, Tom. The tug of war between the geopolitics, the tension not great. And on the other side, you've just got massive production coming out of America. America. And it's always, you know, it's coming out of America, but what will be next? If you look at an Excel spreadsheet, as Deutsche Bank used to look at 20, 30 years ago, of the different geographies of oil, John, and it's a huge, huge uncertainty, Lisa. There also is this, is this question about U.S. production, 13 million barrels, right? We were talking about this incredible record production, plus China weakness. Saudi Arabia just cut prices told to uh, Eastern countries, in part because of a lack of demand. So to try to understand that and then throw in a geopolitical quagmire into the mix, and I guess you have the confusion that we have today in the oil market. Part of what you get here is the view from a different geography. Nadia Martin Wigan is director at Zvielen Capital. We're thrilled that you could join us today from Oslo, uh, Norway. What is the oil distinction of your Norway? It's not that much production. But Norway gets so much credibility within oil analysis. How does that work? Thank you. Well, we are, of course, a steady producer, right? We are a country that delivers oil. Of course, we are not at peak production, and we're declining quite steadily when we look forward after 2025, 2026. Mm -hmm. And on top of that energy transition as well, we're the forefront in terms of Tesla buying and things like that. But we are very reliable in producing and delivering oil and natural gas, as we saw when this uh, war started in Ukraine. A, a two-part question. Is there a one price for oil now, and is that Brent crude? And how does the massive American production change your calculus on what Brent does? The U.S. market is a huge influencer, and it influences not only the oil price, it influences shipping prices and how m movements go all around the world. When we look at Brent, of course, there is the North Sea, which is setting the benchmark, and we look at those physical grades, but they're very small relative to the overall picture. When we see what is the swing crude right now, because of the OPEC cuts, and because Saudi Arabia, yes, they lowered the official selling prices, but they're towing the line and maintaining low production, that swing producer right now is the United States, and that is why okay, it's a huge amazing. influence. It's amazing. an amazing change, yeah. Amazing. It, it raises the question just how influential the cartel still is. Mm -hmm. Just how much power do they have? Well, this was, I think, the big fear that played out yesterday, because by lowering those prices, Saudi Arabia has been saying throughout December, demand is good. But by dropping it so steeply in $2, they're saying, oh, actually, demand is not that strong. At the same time, when we saw U.S. production jump 1.1 million barrels per day year on year last year, oh, are they starting to go for market share? That is the concern. But it's normal for them to cut prices in January. So the market is waiting to see, okay, are they going to be cutting in February, March, and then they start to get worried. So although we had a big sell-off yesterday, we've bounced back and we think that positioning is still late on this move. I'm trying to remember the year. When was the market share gain year? Was that 2014, 2015, when they made a massive push for that? And yes, that all price absolutely. When we finally got that shale invasion on the global market, which we've been waiting for, to be honest, for more than a year. And the demand just kept growing in Asia until it broke the back. Do you think you're going to see a repeat 
of that? Is that what you're suggesting we're looking out no. for? We, we do not see that right now at all uh, being the case because the U.S. growth in, in those years, you know, we, we were looking at 1.52 million barrels per day year on year growth. 1.1 is punchy when the market was expecting 500,000 barrels per day, but it's not enormous. But there is actually an analogy, which is mm -hmm. when oil prices fall to a certain level, the shale patch doesn't make sense and production stops or slows and you see rigs taken offline. Are we close to that kind of point? If the U.S. is the swing producer, are we close to them adjusting supplies in response to a lack of demand? We would need to see WTI trading in the low 60s before I think there is a change in behavior. But because we have such a low duck count, right, the drilled uncompleted wells, the response will be slower. So this is where we expect seasonally a slowdown in that production because they're not supersonic prices, they're steady prices. But we're not going to see that kind of growth like we saw last year. The big change, though, is we should start to see rig counts actually increase some, which we didn't see last year. And that's what the market really got wrong. Bear with me because this is sort of complicated, but I remember when people argued that part of the reason oil prices were going down was because rates were so high. There was an actual cost to parking your capital in a physical good that wasn't generating uh, the same kind of income that T-bills were. If the Fed cuts rates, could that effectively send more investors into oil and cause oil prices to rise? It could, yes, and, and it, because especially the expectation will that demand will be higher, right? So then we, when we look at our forecast right now for the U.S., we're only seeing maybe 50,000, 100,000 barrels per day year in year growth in demand. It can be much higher. When we look at China, the expectation is 400,000 barrels per day year in year growth versus 1.6 last year. It's very tepid. So changes can absolutely drive that. The big driver this year, though, is non-OECD Asia ex-India, ex-China. That's 500, 600,000 barrels per day year on year growth that didn't come last year that we thought would come last year. We haven't even mentioned the conflict in the Middle East. Yeah. And I'm really struggling to even understand what to look for to understand when this will influence oil prices because everyone was expecting it to and then it didn't. Mm -hmm. What are you watching for to understand that, yes, this is going to actually have a disruptive influence? Firstly, we're watching crude flows and product flows, right? So we have seen less Russian crude going through the Red Sea, but that's alongside what they were supposed to cut. So there's no big change there. We're also looking to see product exports out of the Middle East into Europe. Those should really slow down. Those should really pump up middle distillate prices, yeah. which then should support oil. That's the part that we haven't seen yet. I, I want to take a summary question mm -hmm. back to your work at Morgan Stanley at Philbro years ago. Mm -hmm all that you've done in commodities. Where in God's name is U.S. oil policy or U.S. oil production in five years or 10 years? Do you have any sense of the dynamic we have out to 2030? I believe that there has been a strong understanding that we need to maintain energy security. The reason we maintained lower oil prices last year and the year before was because we had a strong SPR and because we have massive production. So I think the investment will continue to be in natural gas and in oil. China is taking this out of our playbook, being the number one investor in renewables, you know, big oil producer, importing gas. And so I, I think we will absolutely continue to do this. However, when we look at these golden patches, maybe there's only 2 million barrels per day additional growth to come. It's still a massive number, 15 million barrels per day. Can I squeeze this day. in just on U.S. Mm -hmm. production and reserves? So we drained the strategic midterm reserve yes. a couple of winters ago. What's left and when are we refilling it? And are we going to do that going into an election this year? Well, I, I think this depends a lot on that relationship with Saudi Arabia, right? When we had this near peace coming before the Hamas attack, we had Saudi Arabia announcing more oil coming back, and then we had immediately after the attack, Biden saying we're going to buy oil at $79 a barrel. They bought a very small token amount. But we're in a happy range, I think, for the electorate. Of course, the electorate would like it lower, but we're not in a dangerous range. So I think slow buying will continue. But I also think we will see policy that is supportive of continued investment in oil and gas, and that will really support things forward. Nadia, thank you. It's good to see you here in New York City. Nadia Martin Wigan there as Felon Capital. From New York City, equities just about 
just about a session lows. We're negative 0.4% on the S&P 500. In just a moment, we'll talk about the US economy. The data still to come this week. CPI, the highlight of the data this week on Thursday. We'll catch up with Mike McKee of Bloomberg and Neil Dutta of Renaissance Macro around the table with us here in New York. From New York, good morning. This is the conversation in the commercial break. Neil and I are talking about economics and economic forecasting. And TK yeah. wants to know when Man City Tottenham are playing. It's a big deal. It's a draw. I, yeah. I still don't get the <laughs> FA Cup. There's Clearly. Premier League. They play Man U this weekend. Great. Yeah. And then there's Champions thing over in Europe. Champions the thing. FA Cup is just in the United Kingdom. This education has been going on for how long now? I still, I'm, I know, I'm totally honestly. baffled I'm by it. I'm sort of giving up. You should have graduated no. by now. Equity yeah, futures on the S&P. <laughs> <Like this. laughs> Extension course. <laughs> on the S&P exactly. 500. Thinking. The Phoenix. Uh. We're negative here by 0.44% on the S&P. Just a little <laughs> softer. You. Yields are up by a couple of basis points on a 10-year 4.0. Zero <laughs> quality C. 5%. Just keep going. Yields up by a couple of basis <laughs> points. Is that what we're calling my grades, a quality C? You're giving me a quality. <laughs> He's seen on football, and that was I, I was thankful to get that. Frankly. Mike McKee, top of the class. He joins us now. CPI, Mike McKee, PPI. Lots to no, look ahead to. No great inflation here. <laughs> well, let's get trade out of the way. We get the trade balance. It's negative 63.2 billion. That is down from 64.5 in the prior month. This is a November number, and it's a revision from the first estimate. But basically, what it tells us is that the trade deficit is little changed. Probably hasn't. Uh, big impact on fourth quarter growth. Uh, this difference between October and November, and we'll see what happens when we get December figures. And at the end of January, we get uh, the fourth quarter GDP. Uh, CPI is going to be interesting this week. We've talked about the fact that uh, we're expecting, because of base effects, an increase in the month over month rate, which would push up the year over year rate on the headline. The Fed's going to look past that and look at the uh, look at the uh, core rate and see that it is forecast to be unchanged, which on a base effect would move the year-over-year -year number down. Right. But how do the markets look at it? That's going to be an interesting question. Trevor Weinberg has a blistering note at High Frequency Economics this morning about Europe's behind. He's, he's modeling 1.9% inflation in Europe, whatever. Lagarde's got it going. Is the same pressure with the Fed? Does the Fed have the same pressure as Lagarde's facing at ECB? Well, I, I, I'm hard pressed to judge exactly how much pressure she's facing because there's always pressure. Uh, I don't think the Fed is facing a lot of pressure yet. What may happen is the pressure builds as the election year goes on. Democrats are going to want the Fed to cut rates sooner to help uh, Joe Biden. And uh, uh, of course, we know that Donald Trump is not shy about telling uh, Jay Powell what to do. One question that we were talking about earlier, especially ahead of Michael Barr having a speech today at noon, was a question of what the Federal Reserve is going to do with the short-term funding program that they created for banks to ameliorate some of the risks so that they didn't have to offload treasuries that are underwater. Do we have any sense of how long they're going to continue that for? Uh, we don't. It was done for a year, so uh, it should expire in the coming months. And they haven't given us any indication that they want to change that. And of course, if you start lowering rates, it's going to change the calculation. You may not need it. Um, we haven't needed it basically since uh, the SVB collapse. So uh, I think that one will probably just go by the boards. But these days, you hesitate to make any predictions about what's going to happen in any area of the world. Politics and the Fed. I know a man who's lined up to talk about just that in just a moment. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Tune in Thursday. Mike McKee sitting down 11.30 Eastern time with Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester later on this week, Tom. That is a must-watch. It is a must-watch. I've got a huge respect for her. She is the mathematician, applied pure mathematician, if you will, of, of the Fed. She really understands all the different uncertainties uh, that are out there. Someone that was certitude nailed 2023 was Neil Dodd, a head of economic research at Renaissance Macro. He had an optimism about the American economic experiment. Mr. Dutta was correct. Neil Dutta, the chart is out there right now. I literally call it the Dutta chart, which is OMG, inflation's down, and there's a legitimate real wage out there. What does the x-axis look at on our real wage prosperity? Are we going to see persistent 
real paycheck increases? Uh, it certainly feels that way, uh, Tom. Thanks for having me on. Um, you know, I do think that inflation is on a glide path lower. Um, you know, Mike McKee mentioned uh, the inflation number coming up uh, this week. Well, keep in mind that gas prices will uh, moderate uh, in, in that report. It's likely that food prices will also moderate in that report. So I think the important thing right now is that inflation is slowing in the very visible parts um, of the uh, consumer price basket. I mean, that's really what drives expectations, right? right. I mean, it's the that you're spending your money on often. Let's, and, let, um, let's get it, Neil, just as a time, I want to get this on record for 2024. What's your 2024 GDP call? I think two and a half percent. That's it's two to two and a half percent, I think, is a reasonable range. I mean, I think, John, this is extraordinary to go to two and a half uh, percent. And, and this is a persistence added up over one year over two years, over three years, and it is American exceptionalism. It's amazing, Tom, that it takes a degree of confidence to say things are going to be OK. And Neil, essentially what you're telling us is that things are going to be OK. Can we just talk about the profession? We often talk about this with you, that you're always sort of haunted by what could go wrong and the career risk associated with that. Neil, how do you approach that, just this idea that things can just turn out OK? Well, I think... Um it's, I think, I mean, the base case on society is that we figure things out. I mean, that's sort of, um, that's been my experience. Um, you know, I think people made a lot of, um, you know, got a lot of notoriety for getting one big call right. I mean, in, in 2008, and they've been trading on that <laughs> for, for a long time. I mean, so, uh, you know, I remember, uh, you know, being a young analyst at the time, it was sort of wrong, 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 and then spectacularly right. But I mean, generally speaking, it. It just makes more sense, in my view, to stay on the optimistic, uh, you know, side of the uh, of the fence. Um, and you know, there are times to be concerned about the outlook, but frankly, you know, right now is not one of those times. I mean, we're talking about, um, you know, generally speaking, the economy has been doing better than most people have thought, and inflation is slowing more rapidly than people thought. I mean, so if you're the Fed, you know, what do you do with that? I also think there's a disconnect, really, in the seat that I'm in, which is sort of a, a um, cell side research role versus what policymakers are in or a lot of academics are in. I mean, their job is to protect against the downside. My job is to position clients to catch the upside. So um, I think it's sort of a, th there's a distinction there that I think needs to be appreciated. Neil, one reason why I love speaking with you is because you like to be contrarian to some degree. And what you're putting out there sounds like it's not contrarian at this point, that a lot of people would agree with you. Soft landing is increasingly the base case. Does it make you uncomfortable? that the rest of the world agrees with you? No, it doesn't. I mean, because this job is about picking your battles with the consensus wisely. I mean, most of the time, you know, the consensus, you know, it's wisdom of crowds, right, Lisa? Uh, but, um, you know, there are times to pick your battles and times not to. And um, I think, you know, when I look at the, you know, sort of distribution of probabilities out there, um, I think it's more likely uh, that we have a uh, what feels like a soft landing for the time being. There may be risks out there, but there's a significant uh, sort of uh, disinflation in the pipeline. Uh, you know, we know that used car prices will continue to moderate over the next couple of months. We know that housing rental inflation will continue to moderate, you know, over the next couple of quarters. Uh, that's going to be important. And at the same time, uh, you know, you're seeing renewed confidence in the corporate sector. I mean, this morning we learned that uh, small business sentiment's at a five-month high. We've seen corporate, uh, sorry, consumer confidence uh, begin to pick up. Households are feeling better about their personal financial situation. So, you know, this idea that the labor markets are going to spontaneously combust in that kind of a situation, I think, is uh, unlikely. And so my sense is that, uh, you know, we continue to see sort of solid, uh, you know, modest jobs growth yeah. uh, and falling inflation. Um, so to me, it's, you know, I'm not, I mean, it's like the last year, as I said, it's is, is always trying about, it, it has been, has felt like, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying to catch the next thing, like the next pivot, the next pivot, like right. rates go up to 5% now come down. I mean, right now, I don't know, I feel like let's just catch our breath and, uh, you know, and, you know, kind of, um, you know, run in place for the next few months. I Neil, mean, I, I, think, I think the markets uh, and the economy are in a good place. How much is running in place and a sort of rosier outlook predicated on the idea of oil prices remaining where they are? I mean, that's part of it. But, um, you know, I mean, gas prices are down. Uh, oil production is up. Um, 
But I think, to me, it's predicated on the Fed responding to inflation as it's coming in, right? I mean, so if inflation is moderating, I think it's important for the Fed to adjust their policy stance. If they don't do that, then the risks begin to build into the economic outlook. I remember in the early days of Twitter, TK used to put out posts and they'd basically say, Neil, something, something, discuss. I'm going to do that to you right now, Neil. Politics and the Federal Reserve, discuss. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, you definitely, um, first of all, politicians should not be kind of opining on the Fed. I mean, I think uh, Democratic Representative Ro Khanna talked about how he wanted, uh, you know, the Fed to start cutting soon to sort of save Biden's reelection chances. Um, and uh, I think former President Trump was on the ta tapes recently talking about how he wants the economy to, to crash. I mean, a very honest sort of assessment uh, going into the election. But look, I don't need politics to make the call that the Fed's going to cut. All I need is the data. It has nothing to do, in my view, with politics. Um, if you wanted the Fed to juice the economy going into the election, they should have already been cutting. I mean, because a lot of the people talking about how the Fed uh, is political have also been many of the same people that talk about long and variable lags and, uh, and so forth. So, um, you know, I think in many cases, um, you know, that topic gets a lot more sort of uh, ammunition than it probably should. But ultimately, I think uh, for the Fed, it's about the economic data. And, um, you know, look, I mean, how political can the Fed be? I mean, the markets are pricing in five or six cuts uh, this year, and the Fed is saying three at the moment. Maybe they go to four, but they're not signaling more than the market. So if they really wanted to be political, wouldn't they be saying even more than what the markets are pricing in? So um, I don't really buy it. I think the Fed's following the economic data as it's coming in. And frankly, if you look at it historically, at the time of the first rate cut, core inflation is running uh, at about you know, 2.2, 2.5% at the time of the first cut on a three-month basis. We're already there. I mean, believe it or not, core inflation over the last six months is below 2%. It's 1.9% at an annual rate. Similarly, the unemployment rate is about 30 basis points off of its low historically at the time of the first cut. Guess what? We're there. Uh, we're at 3.7%. The cycle low was 3.4. So I think if you look at it from a historical perspective, uh, the Fed has plenty of ammunition to make the case uh, to cut interest rates. They don't have to cut a lot because the economy is okay. But in terms of like a recalibration of policy, I think that that's likely. We knew you had thoughts on that particular subject, Neil. We appreciate them. It's good to catch up, buddy, as always. Neil Data there of Renaissance Macro. TK, looking for those surgical cuts from the Federal Reserve. I think he's where I am. He just didn't want to say it. Greenspan invented measured as far as I'm concerned, and I really have trouble with it. You know, you come out, you're in the press conference, McKee asks a question you don't want to answer, and you say, you know, Mike, we're just going to do one and done. We're going to make a cut just to get it going and then we're going to sit and observe until Neil Dutta says we can cut again. Why can't they do that? Why do we have to wait, wait, wait for a measured trajectory? Because Alan Greenspan codified it years ago. We would all love to see you as the next Fed chair. Could you, we do yeah, love that. Yeah, please. We don't read the minutes now. I, would, I still wouldn't <laughs> answer. I'd still put McKee's would read, question last. Would you last. read the minutes of you... If yeah, I'd read the minutes. With if, the chair. If you make me chairman, yeah, <laughs> I'll read the minutes. That's the deal. That's a promise. Better okay. a promise. Okay. I'll if you are just joining us, that. welcome to the program, <clears throat> particularly the president who might be looking for a future Fed chair. <laughs> who knows? <laughs> Equity futures on the S&P, negative 0.5%. Yield was just a little bit higher. We're basically unchanged here, Lisa, 4% on a 10-year. And really, we're all watching CPI on Thursday and J.P. Morgan and Bank of America earnings on Friday at a time where otherwise things are just kind of whipsawing right now. I'm not sure where the compass is. People just kind of trying to trade and readjust and Tom yawning as he tries to avoid the meeting, meeting, meeting minutes. And that's kind of where we are. On this. I think Neil nailed it. We're always trying to chase the next turn. <laughs> yes. We're always trying to chase the next turn. And you're always trying to chase the next turn. And Neil's basically just saying for him, not much has changed. Doesn't really believe in those long and variable lags. The economy stood up to higher interest rates. Well, his view, disinflation can continue. Real incomes will look OK. Two to two and a half percent GDP <clears throat> growth. Tom, Fed reducing interest no. rates for now. Now, for the time being, that's his view. The lesson here, Daryl Cronk, Wells Fargo, Neil Dutter Renaissance, they're not looking at the parlor game tick by tick as entertainment week by week. They're out a quarter. They're out two quarters. They're out Q3 2024. We'll try and get out 12 months with Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Economics and Bloomberg Intelligence up next on interest rates. Your equity market, session lows. This is Bloomberg.
modestly adding to our positions in fixed income. We still look at the income on high quality bonds as a great way to sit here, get paid to wait. Right now, the pivot party's feeling a little bit like maybe a hangover. Maybe we're like trying out dry January here or something as the markets are now back to this good news on the economic front, which is causing yields to back up, being sort of bad news on the equity. We transitioned pretty quickly there, didn't we? Emily Rowland of John Hancock from Emily Rowland's Pivot Party of late 2023 and Bramo's Sober January of 2024. It's kind of been the story of the last, I don't know, month or so. Your equity market on the S&P 500 pulling back by 0.6%. Actually a decent day of gained in yesterday's session. The biggest one-day pop going back to the middle of November on the NASDAQ 100. That was a gain of more than 2%, a tidy day of gains, led by tech stocks like NVIDIA, but also consumer discretionary names as well. The financials had a really difficult time through much of last year. And then things turned around to the back end of the year. And Lisa, you'd have to say that was very, very dependent on what happened in the Treasury market all year. <clears throat> Which is counterintuitive because you think higher yields, more income for the banks. But if the Fed is going to cut rates, the feeling is this could unleash capital markets activity and really reignite some of the profits that we saw missing from the likes of Jefferies. We could see that for the past year, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, very different <laughs> performances. JP Morgan leading the charge up 25 percent, Citigroup up 14 uh, percent, Bank of America the laggard. All of them reporting earnings on Friday. Why is Bank of America the laggard? And John, to me, this is interesting, partly because of their portfolios of treasuries, which raises this question. If the Fed does end this program, does the treasury holding of a bank like Bank of America become more of a liability now that they have to, uh, you know, well, what sort about of the smaller the banks? There's been a lot out in the zeitgeist about yeah. the smaller and regionals far more affected than Fortress Moyne. Well, Tom, I think this just raises the question across the board. What's more important to these bank stocks for the rest of this year? Is it the guidance you get on Friday, <clears throat> the following Tuesday, or is it where the 10-year yield finishes the year? What's more important for the year ahead? All I know, you know, Lou Crandall was quoted, I think it was in Zero Hedge. Lou Crandall is the giant. He basically invented analyzing short-term paper. And Lou's got some real concern about what these smaller banks, these lesser banks do, if you will. The regionals, yeah. Legit. Many of them still holding on. <clears throat> We're going to move forward with this discussion, and we can do that with Ira Jersey, Chief U.S. Interest Rate Strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence, only talks to us on Fed Day. We dragged him out of storage this morning to start the year strong. Ira, I don't know if it's the chart of the year, but I know it's the Ira Jersey chart. All you need to know on radio is interest rates were zero, and Ira Jersey went out and pulled together all the different money market fund yields into a ginormous 5% yield with a huge buildup in assets along the way. Ira, where are we in one year? Are we going to unload our money market funds and put it other places? So I, I actually think that money market funds will continue to be the investment of choice for people who don't want to take a lot of either interest rate risk or equity-like risk, uh, just because you're going to still probably get much more than you can say in a bank deposit. Remember, Tom, most of those, uh, most of the money market assets that you've seen flow in haven't been from riskier assets. They've really been from mm -hmm. uh, from bank deposits, and that's one of the reasons why you had, uh, you know, still some angst among some banks that they, you know, are losing their liability base, which is these deposits, and and that is is something that you know regulators certainly are looking at very closely right now is, you know, how can banks maintain their deposit base when interest right. rates are so different between the instruments? And the distinction here is liquidity, no, but much more solvency, the dynamic of bank balance sheets. Are we at a solvency risk for not all, but some of our banks? Well, a better question for our bank analysts, but I don't, I don't think so. I think, you know, the low-hanging fruit, the people, the banks that didn't do a great job hedging, didn't necessarily have the properly diversified portfolios, those are the ones that are probably out of the way right now. Um, and not, not only that, but I think that there's some more confidence in the banks because it's pretty clear that the Federal Reserve and other regulators are willing to step in to provide enough liquidity for banks that have, you know, okay assets and uh, have only uh, been losing on a mark-to-market -market basis as opposed to to having a lot of credit losses because that was the interesting thing back in March, right? That the banks that lost money lost it because of you know basically bad trades as opposed to uh, bad assets, which are two different things. How far did yields have to come in 
for uh, them not to be an issue for some of the existing holdings still out there on bank balance sheets, but also just in general for investors who haven't wanted to sell uh, and be underwater? Yeah, so, so I mean, if you were holding 10-year treasuries, you know, three years ago when interest rates were at zero and now, you know, those same assets are upwards of, of 4%, obviously you have a big mark-to-market -market loss. Now, the difference is, and, and I think that this is an important distinction, if you hold a mutual fund or an ETF that invests in bonds, those are structurally lower. And those are what we call uh, constant maturity instruments. So those are always, those instruments are always buying new bonds, selling bonds when they go toward maturity. But if you hold, say, a 2% 10-year bond from a couple of years ago, you, that's now a 7-year bond, and eventually that will mature at, at par. So yes, you're losing opportunity costs in terms of interest, but you're also not really losing principal unless you actually sell that instrument. So I think that that's, you know, that's always a, a problem that you have in fixed income if you're going to hold to maturity or not. And if you, you don't and you, say, reinvest that at higher yields now, it, it's not going to change your investment profile very much. I've been trying to uh, spend the past five, six trading days of uh, 2024 creating a narrative that's going to exist for the entirety of it. And there, one thing that people keep talking about is that it's going to be a trading range kind of year, that they're going to look and try to just sort of readjust around where we are right now. Is this basically a trader's market and everyone's living in it? I think near term that, that that's very true. In fact, you know, we actually think uh, I noticed a headline from uh, Bill Gross this morning. He's saying that that he thinks that even at four percent, that that ten year yields are overvalued. Um, I think that that's probably true in the near term. But you know, we're talking about a three eighty to four twenty five ish kind of range. I think on on ten year yields. Um, and and the, part of the reason for that is that we're already pricing a lot of Federal Reserve cuts, and we're pricing for a pretty bad economy. Now we have to wait to see will that material in the near term. And then once we see the data go one way or the other, either you're going to have weaker data that's going to prove that the Fed is going to cut, that means that 10-year yields will probably rally. And if you don't get a particularly bad economic outcome over the next couple of, uh, a couple of months, then maybe 10-year yields stay here or maybe even sell off 15, 25 basis points. Ira, good to catch up, sir. Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Thanks, Intelligence, sir. just framing that debate right now in the bond market, the range for treasuries. Marka Kalanovic of JP Morgan oh, pushing please. back against some of these calls. Listen to this. Disinflation not likely to be sufficient for rate cuts by March. Absent a growth threat, our central view is that it would take more time for central banks to reach the conclusion <clears throat> they can start reducing interest rates and to look to mid-year as the most likely time for DM central bank easing to begin. Not pushing back against the concept of cuts, Tom, just pushing back against the timing yeah, of them. Yeah, well, I think Bruce Kasman was there. I don't know if he's reading Kasman's literature, but, you know, there, there is an argument being made out there that March is a little bit rushed, particularly with the institutional heritage of the Fed. And we can get things done in June. And, you know, that, that's one of the beliefs out there. Marco Klanovic also pointed out that rising geopolitical risks and uh, potential supply chain issues might reignite inflation and sort of raises this question, what's the bigger risk? Recession or not even recession, but just a downturn that's not expected um, or reinflation. And if they're the same risk and it could really come down to something geopolitically, how do you prepare for something like that when it's just, you know, one of those things that could happen? Those are the sum of all our fears. And I would take someone like young Dutta and link him with older and respected Yardeni. Ed Yardeni writing last night about this in his notes. There's always fears out there, individual and particularly aggregated together, as Elarian would say, the unknown unknowns. You know what? People wake up to go to business. The most important thing I heard today was small business is back up off some really ugly numbers. Confidence, yeah. The confidence is, you know, is it robust? No, but it's there. And, you know, we're open for business. And I, I just put in my, you guys were babbling on about something. Thanks. And I put in my order for my <laughs> Apple Vision Pro. Of course you did. Pro. $3,000. I mean, can you see me with the Apple Vision dollars. Pro thing going on? Neil Dutta. Afterthoughts on it. Great conversation. Find that on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg Terminal. TK, you know colleagues that don't take off the holiday period when they probably should take off the holiday period, when it's really quiet and there's no work to do, and then they take like the second week of January off. Do you know yeah. those colleagues? Those yeah. kind of colleagues. When things start they're to get busy, jerks. then they go they're such then they jerks, go skiing. All of them. Aren't yeah. they just terrible? Yeah, they're horrible they're people. You have the holidays, it's really quiet. Everyone should take time off. And then you always have that group of individuals that are <laughs> okay, super strategic <laughs> about it. And then the second week of January, they're like, it's time to go skiing. Bramo's yeah. gone skiing. 
Well, Grandma's can't skate. You know, it's, it's like, she's like, you know. <laughs> We're going to miss you, Lisa. Thanks. I would, I, would, I would say Which I'm going to miss you. Which continent are we going to <laughs> this <laughs> time? Well, look, I mean. Or, which, look, is this like I a just, Bond you know, movie? Are you in I, Italy? I, by the time we go next week, it'll be another narrative. It'll be another Very cool. People will be reset. Now, you enjoy yourself. Thank you. Deserve you. It. I appreciate that. You have that. fun on the slopes. <laughs> From New York City, <laughs> this is Bloomberg. <laughs> 